Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert science. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I do light-driven chemistry, which means I shine photons on things and try to do useful things with it, whether it be chemical reactions, doing solar cells, whatever it may be. But more importantly, joining me today, my guest is Dr. Andy Opel. Andy, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ken. I am a professor in the School of Communication. I have uh, done a lot of documentary work and uh, I've also written about uh, social movements and uh, environmental activism and currently I'm working on uh, immersive media and developing uh, prototypes for uh, climate communication in VR. It's really fun. What, what do you typically teach? Where? What do you typically oh, teach? Oh, well, uh, to, uh, I used to always teach a documentary production class and then a class uh, called Media, media Culture in the Environment that was uh, for both, I had a graduate version and an undergraduate version. Um, and then uh, lately the, the production stuff has moved to, to VR mm. and, um, and, and more immersive 360 video. And, and I'm still teaching the, the media culture and environment class that I, I developed it when I first got here in 2001. So it's been about 20 years of, um, wow. but, uh, but uh, a lot of changes in those 20 years. So say, a lot yeah. of updating and, and keeping it current because the environmental situation needs a lot of attention. And I love, I love teaching the undergrad version of that class. Cause, um, it's a little bit, it's a, it's the one large lecture class that I teach. And I, and I like getting a lot of students in front of that subject matter and getting them talking and thinking about, about the climate crisis and, and environmental issues. That's really cool. Equally important. What game are we starting with? We are starting with Quake, which takes me back to, uh, I got my first computer in 1996 when I started my master's program at the university of Oregon. So my wife and I, she also was starting a master's program uh, at that same time. And this was our first computer and Quake was our first game that we shared together. And we've um, awesome. gone on to play lots of other games over time. But um, uh, this, uh, I thought this would be a nice chance to, you know, Take us back, back in time, and, and revisit. Uh, oh. revisit the dungeons of Quake. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're all about it. The nostalgia trip. It'll come back very, very quickly. Oh, that's awesome. So, how big is your class? The, the uh, well, the the media and environment class can be up or up to 120, but I haven't um, I haven't been teaching that. Uh, the last couple of semesters, uh, there's been a, some graduate students who have been really interested in in taking that on, and um, so and and that's been great because then that's freed me up to do. Uh, you know, I've been doing these more experimental classes where I really don't have as much experience uh, uh, with the, some of the software in VR production as I should, mm -hmm. um, and but this allows me to um, to to learn the material along with the students. There you go, and. Um, uh, and um, and so the, the so my production classes are almost all small. Well, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, twenty and twenty and under, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's really nice because I, I really like uh, working closely with the students and and helping them helping them develop projects. That's one of the great things about media production is the collaboration that happens with the students and and uh, working together to make to make interesting things happen uh, mm -hmm. and, and create interesting products. You know, everybody um, everybody will watch a video and they'll even watch a video of a professor playing a, an old video game. Uh, but but not everyone will read your scientific work or your uh, or your, your journal article. So and this is true of, of students, too, um, um, that uh, that when they when they do um, visual work in my classes, uh, you know, their families and friends will, will all pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, oh, they're getting me from across the way. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, Don't worry, we can invoke God mode if you... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm perfectly fine. Let's earn it. Uh, you know, uh, it's the nature of the beast, right? You're gonna... You're gonna... Yeah, it's, it's trial and error, especially these older games. They they didn't they weren't forgiving. Like even on normal mode, it was not trivial. They wanted to eat, cor eat your quarters. Um, yeah, so uh, it's 
but yeah, 20 years teaching the same class, mm -hmm. especially with the technology innovations. So today, coincidentally, I, I'm teaching general chemistry, which is the big gen chem class. Yeah. But I'm talking about solubility and equilibria and multiple equilibria. And one of the things we talk about is film development. Uh -huh. Right. And so you take the, you know, silver bromide sheets and shine light on them. Yeah. And you have to do developer fix or blah, blah, blah. And every year I've taught this for the last decade. I have my students raise your hand, raise their hand like, how many of you had to develop film? Like deliver it at a Walmart or Kmart, uh -huh, uh -huh. and it's exponential. <laughs> How number of hands go down every year? Because <laughs> they, I mean, they grew up in the digital age, right? I mean, right, right, right. Well, the whole idea of having to be careful about the number of pictures you take is, yeah. is really, yeah, yeah. And it being precious. An anachronism. It just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we worry about filling up our hard drives or or we worry about trying to find all the photos that we've taken. Yeah, I think that's going to be our bigger issue, just documenting and bookkeeping. and Because even with my, my cell phone, I transferred cell phones over and like the date, uh, the timestamp on the photos, some of them just completely screwed up to 2035 and like 2082. And it's like, I'm going to lose a lot of information through the digital, digital transfer. Different problems, oh, man. So, uh, so I need. I know I need my up and down arrows here uh, closer. To, I can't because uh, is there a way to shoot with my? Um, so try escape. Other than other than the mouse. So uh, let's try escape. See if you can. Uh, oh, oh um, go to options. Yeah. See if you can remap your hotkeys. Um, yeah. Here we go. Um, Customize controls. That's the first one. There we go. Oh, okay. control shoots. So you can do control button. Oh, control is control is shoot. Yep, I think according to that, yeah. Okay, all right, that'll that'll help me. Okay. But yeah, anyone just joining us, ask a scientist, gaming, mediocre gameplay expert, science. Our guest is Andy Opel. He's an expert in documentary film. I mean, history, theory, production. He's interested in all of it, particularly a recent transition towards VR and applying that in, in filmmaking, which I'm intrigued about and we'll no doubt dive into. But if you guys have any questions, throw them in chat. We'll make sure to get to those questions while we figure out Quake. <laughs> right. and, and and thinking about you know thinking about media and 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 the environment like the. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of activism these days, by particularly by the uh, Extinction Rebellion movement in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, this dog is getting me. Um, and uh, and you know, and and how they're getting media attention, whether it's working, and what, who's responding to, you know, to their work. I think these are all good questions, um, mm -hmm. and and that have a lot of history too, because because Greenpeace started back in the '70s. With their activism around around whales, and they got a lot of media attention by filming themselves um, uh, in little boats, um, uh, getting getting between the Russian whalers and the whales, mm -hmm. and that was like really the first kind of direct action activism of, of environmentalists, <laughs> and um, and that you know it was had a huge impact on on the rise of Greenpeace. Um, Oh, that's interesting. I, I did not expect that. Yeah, yeah. And you can, there's actually a, a 1970s Greenpeace documentary all on YouTube. It's in six parts, and it was all shot on 16 millimeter film. It's really beautiful, but it's really classic. You know, everybody's in their 70s jean jackets out in the North Pacific, right? Because they were leaving out of Seattle and Vancouver, BC to go try and find these Russian whalers. Mm hmm. And um, and then they're playing. They're in there. They're in little boats. Um, in these little Zodiac boats, playing saxophone to the whales. And, um, and uh, you know, it's some amazing footage. Um, but I think one of the most dramatic pieces is when then the Russian whale shoots the harpoon right over the heads of, of the activists when they're in the little boat, and it and it shows them risking their lives yeah. for the whales. Which uh, prior to that, you know, people hadn't really done that. Um, so so that was a. Uh, you know, it was pretty dramatic and, and, mm -hmm. and, and got a lot of attention. And and now, you know, now we just... Uh, yeah, the shotgun is just not doing it it's at just range. Not doing it, no. Yeah. Uh, no, that, uh, that's a little better. Come on, there's a bunch of... Nice. Them. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 dramatic how much just having footage of something can matter. I mean, especially like recently with the the, the police brutality and stuff, just how much it's changed with 
digital footage. Well, and we camera. used to think, I know, well, and this, but this is a real question. We used to think that if we just had images, uh -huh. that it would that it would change things, and 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 unfortunately, you know, it hasn't been the case. Um, um, you know, we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of evidence where, and going back to Rodney King, mm -hmm. right, where we, we had, you had the footage of the police and then they all got acquitted. Yeah. And it caused some of the largest riots in LA, you know, in the 1990s. We have all the footage of that as well. Oh, right. Which is right. quite dramatic. Right. Hmm. Um, so, you know, so the, the, the tactics that are being used right now, uh, let's see. Um, oh, um, by the by, a sunrise movement and and, and uh, extinction rebellion, um, you know I think there's been a lot of criticism of them, mm -hmm. but uh, but they've gotten you know, you know they've gotten people talking about okay what do we value do we value artwork or do we value species and and right now you know we've seventy percent I was reading recently seventy percent of the um, of the wildlife uh, has has died in the last uh, since 1950 Jeez. um yeah and, and so it's just you know it's really um yeah a, a, an incredible you know the role of eight billion people on the planet but well, there he is uh is 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 having a, uh oh, um, uh you know the role uh, it's it's having a huge impact and uh, on all the way back to the beginning uh, oh no <laughs> <laughs> well, if your health is low I think if you tilde give health, you can get it back. So. Okay, all right, let's let's try that. Let's see. So typing give, give, give health, health, no space. Oh, no space. Unknown command, that is not going to do it. Uh, try God. <laughs> let's see if God mode works. God mode, God on. mode on. All right. <laughs> yeah, let's let's chill. Let's, <laughs> let's relax. <go. laughs> let's see how this goes. <laughs> Yeah, before getting into the serious topics, I guess let's start with the easy one. Five-year-old Andy didn't necessarily think he'd be playing Quake while talking about documentary filmmaking, no. you know, no. <laughs> decades later. Right. What, what was what was the path that led you to oh, where well, your this is, is? Yeah, We only have three hours. <laughs> it's, it's quite a crooked what's, path. What's, what's but, the uh, elevator version of Okay, this? right, 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 the elevator version. Mm -hmm. uh, the elevator version. Don't let this dog kill you. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Um, uh, let's see. I uh, I did my undergraduate work in anthropology, mm. and um, and got and traveled to Nigeria to study the Yoruba talking drum, mm. and uh, as on a, on a grant, um, and was really inspired by doing ethnographic work then. And um, but I really realized in doing that uh, just how uh, how much okay. I'm never going to understand Yoruba society in Nigeria. Like that is a. a you know, a very far away and complicated yeah, history yeah. And, and culture that I'm not going to. So I said, all right, I want to try and turn my attention to understanding U.S. culture and politics. And um, anyway, ended up out in Oregon uh, in the 1990s. And um, a lot of logging was going on in the national forests. As you, these were the Earth First, uh, mm -hmm. Spotted Owl Wars, they were called, mm. Clinton administration. And that really politicized me to uh, a, a lot of... Um, land use policies to the connect to what an indicator species is so and and how uh, ecosystems function um, the environmental law conference at the University of Oregon is um, is a very you know really well-known law conference and so I attended that that was always open to the public I was renting a room in a house um, that was owned by an environmental lawyer and uh, and so so then that led me to a master's program in the University of Oregon um, uh, and I, but I really got talked into that program by uh, a, a professor named Al Stavitsky. Uh, you know, I didn't set out to go to, the, I was trying, my motto at that point in my life was the last thing you want is a job. <laughs> Any, anyone can get a job. The trick is not having a job. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to be a musician. And, um, and, uh, but then I, then I got talked into this master's program and in, in, in the media and, uh, in, um, journalism and, um, communication school at the University of Oregon and uh, and put together my own documentary program because I had a friend this is uh, shortly after Errol Morris and well Michael Moore's um, Roger and me had come out oh yeah and so it was really kind of just the, the early ages of documentary and um, and so I put together a documentary program as a part of that master's program and um, 
and realized, oh, this is great. I can, I'm getting paid more. Um, I guess oh, I'm in God mode, so I really don't know. I don't need to be so careful. <laughs> you don't. No, just have fun. Sorry. Just, um, just murder so, away. Um, so, uh, um, so I that and that program showed me that oh wow, people are thinking in much deeper and more complex ways about the relationship between the environment and media and activism than than I was as a kind of an underground person. Uh, thinking, you know, trying to engage the pol politics of, of old growth forests. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I got really inspired and, and, um, really, uh, and then decided to apply to PhD programs. And I got into the university of North Carolina doctoral program on a, with a park fellowship. And, and that was a great experience as well. Got to be in Chapel Hill for three years. Mm. And, um, and then, uh, and then, Came down here as my first job. Didn't didn't I, I interviewed here on election day two thousand and one, or not election day on inauguration day two thousand and one. Sorry. And and for those for students that may or all the listeners may recall that was when George W. Bush was being installed um, after the Supreme Court had made the decision uh, about that election. Yeah. And um and so when I got here, almost immediately was taken to the inaugural ball B A W where Tallahassee's progressive community was in mourning because after what had happened and because so much of those that had played out here in Tallahassee mm -hmm. um, Catherine yeah. Harris and Jeb Bush and the whole cast of characters so um, so then I called my wife that night I said you know I, I wasn't sure if we were thinking about coming here, but this is pretty interesting what's going on here. We might have to think about it. So then, uh, here's the key. This one. So then, uh, next thing you know, um, uh, I was being offered a position and came, and, and FSU has been, been really great to, to me and the family, and lots of opportunities, lots of great students. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's been, uh, it's been uh, this time has gone very quickly. So uh, here we are. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Everyone has their unique timeline. A lot of students just think we, we, we were destined for this job, like you're, you're academic, you're ivory tower, you're brilliant. And it's like, no, we're not. We're lucky. We're, we're uh, circumstance driven. Like it's, yeah, it's convoluted for all of us. Yeah, I, and and some you know I, I often recommend students take some time between their uh, grad, uh, you know, undergrad and grad because that time was invaluable for me. I taught I taught it a little. Um, alternative boarding school in the mountains of North Carolina hmm. for three years before I went out to Oregon. And that was incredible. That was, uh, uh, that's where I lived in a chicken coop. And, um, and we, the whole school was heated by wood and the, the, <laughs> the run by consensus. So it taught me a lot about consensus, decision-making and group process. And you see a lot of that same, um, kind of decision-making model playing out in, uh, in things like the uh, the Occupy movement and, and different social movements of try, you know try and use some of that non hierarchical kind of participatory decision making, um, uh, and so and so it's been it was really helpful to to get exposed to that at a young age. Um, so those those experiences between my undergrad and my grad were were essential to my to my growth and the, and what then led me into uh, into media documentary concern about environmental issues um and trying to you know trying to connect the, the dots on some of these things um, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's one of the things that like flexibility in your choices and career and redirecting your path it's one thing i did find frustrating at fsu where they like want you out in four years like that you have to get out 120 credits yeah, yeah. and it doesn't give you a lot of option to like change and second major and like you got to take a path and you're stuck and yeah yeah and uh, and and that is um you know, it's it's tough these days. A lot of students are pushed to, to decide on a major uh, right, away, right out of the gate. Know, yeah. And 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 uh, you know, it's just it's just a big hole. Am I going to fall down into something? Maybe. Well, oh. God mode, we'll find out. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, oh, that's good. That's, that's an elevator. Yeah, yeah, it's so back. funny these um the graphics. You know, like it just it, it takes me right back. Okay, so yeah. Circles. You might have wanted to go that way. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't play much Quake. I played a bunch of Doom, Wolfenstein, oh, pretty yeah. All those came out at similar time yep. intervals. Yeah. Similar styles. 
just going around murdering things. <laughs> You're in a dungeon. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Nondescript no, monsters. Ooh, let's see if you can drown in god mode. We're all, all right, learning something today. Well, is, is space bar jump, maybe? Huh. Yeah. I think you're out of the water. Oh, okay. There we go. Let's see. So, uh, yeah, it was, um, you know, I, uh, I really think it's important for students to get to get to try different things because you don't you don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And and it, whether it's art and science and and the classes that are more applied, classes that are more theoretical. Um, and and there there is there's a lot of pressure on on people to have it all figured out at, at 18 or 20 or even 22. Yeah. And and and, and I think it's. Let's see somebody's shooting at me. Oh, there, there he is. No, I really feel for the students. I mean, especially Gen Kim, because we have a lot of pre med students where it's like, I have to get an A in this, otherwise I won't go to med school. I won't be successful. Right, right. Parents will disown me. Like I, I get the stress, but like you're gonna be okay. <laughs> like. <laughs> It's it's tough. Yeah, you'll have a winding path, but I promise it'll work out well. Well, and 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 having a breadth of experience, you know, there's a, there's a book called Range that I read a year or so ago, which really talks about the value of having a breadth of knowledge and experience, because you never know when you're going to bring in a bit of literature, a bit of you know a, a theoretical a concept, a um, some some mechanical knowledge, like how to how to build something, how to use a saw, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, all these different skill sets um, are are really important, and 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 you don't know when they're when they're when you're going to need them, mm -hmm. so so it's important to, to build a range of skill sets, um, and and to know how to cook. <laughs> Most, <laughs> first and foremost, know how to cook. Universally useful skill, yes, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, <laughs> you yes. heard it here, heard it first time. And especially in the, the place where there's just so much fast food and bad food, you know, you gotta yeah. you gotta take care of yourself. Yeah, as long as there's time. <laughs> JJ, right. the boss, thank you for the 100 bits. <laughs> thank you for the cheer. Uh, first time chat as well. Welcome to the stream. Um, thank you for joining us. If you have questions for Andy, he's happy to answer them. Uh, we will no doubt go on long rabbit, ha pa rabbit holes. Hopefully you guys join us on this journey. Um, but speaking of questions, we actually had one from Reddit. So I, I typically post a Tallahassee subreddit and a few additional ones. Party Guide wants to know, I'm curious to know if Dr. Opal is familiar with Flip My Florida Yard. It is a home improvement type show that flips yards and turns them into more environmentally friendly yards. Oh, no. That, my that my awesome. main question is, do yeah. you think that's a good way to educate the people of Florida? Oh, well, I think it's an, that's an awesome uh, initiative. And, you know, we need to, like, you know, right, death to the yard, right? Death, de death to lawns um, is, yeah. uh, is a good uh, starting place. And, and, and replacing them with you know, insect friendly, pollinator friendly, mm -hmm. uh, native plants is, is awesome, right? It's, it's way more interesting to look at. Um, you know, if you're actively, if you have young kids and you're actively out there running around using it, great. You know, that uh, lawn has a purpose, but you, you just drive around and you see these acres of, mm -hmm. of grass that, that, uh, and that nobody uses. And, um, yeah. and, the, and they're full of pesticides and, and herbicides and yeah so so i think that's a, an awesome initiative i'm not aware of that particular group but um but that's the kind of thing i like to bring up in class and i like to uh, and i like to make connections with those groups because i teach a class on advocacy media production where uh, students then go work with local nonprofits and uh and and produce some media to help them and um and and build build some relationships between fsu and the local community so uh, yeah, if you want to send along a link to, to their site, um, yeah. I'd love to check it out. Yeah. Flip My Yard. And so there's the link. Yeah. They're on the Discover Florida channel. You can find them on Roku, Chromecast, App Store, um, Google Play. Yeah. So if you want to check out the show. I mean, that's interesting. Like, I love the concept behind it. I guess one of the general questions I have for you, all the, the media advocacy, you have like view numbers, but is there any, is there anyone that's tracking like impact, like things like an inconvenient truth? I think it's way to dialogue, but how do you like quantify that? Or how do you, I don't uh, know. Well, there's, um, 
There, there's something called uh, the Impact Guide, which is coming out, comes out of the UK, and they've done a lot of documentary impact analysis, mm -hmm. and they've also put together a really in-depth um, set of tools and a field guide. I believe it's called um, Impact Field Guide. <laughs> it might even be impactfieldguide.org, um, and they uh, it's just really robust. It, um, to get filmmakers thinking from from the beginning about not not okay I've completed a film now how do I get people to see it but to think about your your stakeholders uh, from from the beginning and uh, and integrate it that into into the production process build build viewership and interest along the way mm -hmm. um, yeah so so there so and more and more funders are are looking for uh, impact measures yeah. they're, they're looking for for uh, metrics they don't want to just throw money at things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think, but, but this question of the quantification of impact is 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 challenging because um, you might numbers don't always reflect uh, depth of impact, right? Yeah. People can click things and move on, yep. whereas somebody can hear an idea and it, and it can stick with them and change their life, mm -hmm. right? So and and and, and redirect uh, what they want to do with their their time and energy, and so um, I think. Uh, I think we always have to be a little bit careful about um, about that question about the quantification of of, uh, of of media and 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 it's it's very much a, a function of kind of the neoliberal emphasis on on economics and kind of trying to it, it can reduce things to um, to economics in a way that uh, that I don't think is always um, helpful. Yeah, um, no, it's hard. It's, it's one of those like National Science Foundation, we deal with fundamental research, but also they have to answer to senators. Yeah. So it's like a balance of, you know, I'm studying single electrons that do stuff. How is that going to make, I don't know, telecommunications better? You know? Right. So it's 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 a hard balance. JJ the boss, thank you for the follow. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, throw them in the chat. Um, <laughs> you can see I'm going around in circles if you have any suggestions on where I should go. <laughs> Anyone in chat knows Quake? Because right. I sure don't. Right. <laughs> Andy's yeah, lost. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, well, he's God, but he's trapped uh, in his own hell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's something somewhere. <laughs> no, that's fun, though. There's, there's actual organizations trying to coordinate, you know, understanding impact of things. Yeah, and, 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 and come up with ways um, to measure, measure impact. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but uh, there's a um, Sethi Noyan is a professor out at uh, University of Utah, I believe, and he, he studies games. But he, uh, there's a great um, podcast with him and Ezra Klein on on game theory. But and he really talks about this question about like the quantification of experience and and the ways that it flattens and leaves out, um, you know, leaves out. A, a lot of interesting values and and uh, uh, affective, emotional impact that, mm -hmm. that, that that people have, but but it isn't caught up caught. And and so much of our life has become like these video games, right? Where, um, you know, likes and and yeah. retweets are are. Um, the currency, they're, the they're, currency, they're like right. social currency, yeah. Right, and and he talks about it as um, a values landscape, and how the games then flatten that values landscape, and and reduce it to to what the game, you know, what 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 is winning, what the metrics that the game provides, mm -hmm. and we end up internalizing those values, yep. um, at, at the expense of, of of I think a lot of other um, important ways of. Of thinking about our, our our roles as as individuals, our roles as citizens, uh, you know, family, friends, uh, partners in relationships. Um, uh, so so we have to be careful because I think a lot of our world has become gamified. Yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 that the, and that those games have they're they're encoded with a set of values. Mm -hmm. And. Um, yeah, no, there's a reward system that right, incentivizes right. things that aren't necessarily good. Uh, well, or, or, and and part of the reason they're attractive is because it narrows. It it, it, it it you know clearly what the rewards are, mm -hmm. and you know you know how to win. Mm -hmm. And 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 in life, life is complicated. It's it's not clear. Like when do I win at, at being a, a dad? When do I win at at you know at being a, a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it is it oh I have to get something in Sundance or or um, you know, could it be the person who came up to me after a screening and said, oh, wow, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, you know, I want to, 
I, you know, I, I want to work in, I want to work on the climate crisis or, you know, like what are, what are the things that we use to measure our, our success? Um, so speaking of measuring success, let's put up a prediction, ladies and gentlemen, let's use our imaginary internet currency that is known as standard internet units on our stream. Uh, most of you know, if you've watched Twitch before, you know our predictions are usually game-based. They, they predict whether you're gonna win or lose or whatever it might be. On our stream, we use them to ask questions, questions relevant to our guests' expertise. And so if you're not following, click the follow button, get your 300 standard internet units or use whatever units you have. You can bet on a degree of confidence that you have on the question. Uh, the first one we're going to start with is uh, at least one metric for deciding whether a documentary is successful or not. And so the question is, Michael Moore directed the highest grossing documentary of all time. Is that true or false? And so, yeah, use your standard internet units. Depending on your degree of confidence, you can bet as many as you want. If you look at the top of chat, you can click the predict button. You can gamble as many of these standard internet units that are useless outside of the stream, but you can use them here. Note you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code. Can't look this up via Google. You have to use your knowledge or expertise, and we're hoping you'll answer honestly. So, yes, what is the, did Michael Moore direct the highest grossing documentary of all time? <laughs> Sorry for the detour there. I thought that was an appropriate one for the dialogue. That's good. That's good. But yeah, going after this imaginary currency, and I find myself doing it with this. Like this Twitch is it's a side hobby, but I'm like, how many viewers, how many people saw it? And you just you want to see numbers go up and it's just releasing those endorphins, making you, you know, it's getting that hit of the slot machine, you know? It's it's And 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 the and the clear the clear reward. I won. I, I yeah. You know, and and you know we, that's that's why these that's why games are so powerful and so attractive because 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 you, you, you're constrained and you know you know what to do yeah and, and and even if you have to do it over and over again in a in a uh, uh, here we go something different uh, phew. but that's what's brilliant about it. like I played World of Warcraft a lot and I don't know if you're familiar with that but it's it's it integrated this you know multiplayer world but also like you can do leather working and metal working and you just everything is numbers going up <laughs> it's like express excel spreadsheet for gaming like that's what it ends up being but it it, it satisfies something in our you know psyche so I get it well and then and then a lot of games you know like the whole tycoon series was really popular for a long yeah. time and roller coaster tycoon, tycoon and, yeah. well, and zoo tycoon like I, mm -hmm. I i wrote about that at one point what you know many a number of years ago but just that and how it's it's really not about the topic it's not about either roller coasters or zoo animals it's about managerial thinking right and and so it's um it's you end up not not really learning specifics of of the the subject matter so much as you learn uh you know economic management practices um but if they called it uh you know <laughs> management skills <laughs> tycoon, <laughs> simulator. Right? <laughs> simulator. Right? It's, it's probably not gonna have as many uh sales right so, yeah, yeah, yeah so 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 they wrap it in a you know around zoo animals or roller coasters or other things that are that are more exciting but um yeah, yeah. but because because the animals like i don't know if you ever looked at zoo tiger like they don't they don't really tell you anything about the animals they don't help you understand the state of those animals in the wild what's mm -hmm. happening with them you know what's their habitat what what what's what's threatening those species um you know instead instead it's more just about okay how can i get more people into my uh my zoo and then i can charge them more money <laughs> you know because uh, i can get them to to pay more attention to the, to the new exhibit. Man, I want to believe that that teaches a skill at least, like <laughs> multi-management, you know, having several things going. But. Right, yeah, yeah, it, it does. Well, it does, it teaches, right, you know, right, managerial thinking, right, where you've got a cost-benefit analysis, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. like a, a, allocating resources to, to different, um, you know, different areas, but, uh, but I, but I think there are, you know, there's room for other other things that, yeah. that can also be games. You know, like I think one of the things I proposed at the end of that paper was like, you know, hunt the poachers, right? Like, like um, <laughs> you know, like how, find, figure out how to protect game in a, in a wildlife, a huge wildlife park in Kenya. Yeah. Right? And um, wh where are the poachers coming? Who are they? And how do you stop them? Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Um, you know, or, you know, how do you, how do you, like there's a oh there's a great um I think it's I want to say it's called 
saving the rhino. It's about it's about the 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 value of the of rhino. They they realized in this one part in uh, East Africa, uh, the how the economic value of having the rhinos, and um, uh, and and they um. The, the local people really realized they were way more valuable to keep them alive than they were to, to hunt them and cut off their horn. And, um, uh, and that was, you know, real, um, really interesting economic um, development model based around ecotourism. Then. Yeah. All right. So what is the answer? Did Michael Moore direct the highest grossing documentary of all time? True or false? What's your answer, Andy? True. True. And does anybody have a guess what that was? Yeah, anyone in chat want to put the, the, the documentary on? Yes, several. Roger and me, Bowling for Columbine, Fahrenheit 9-11. What else? Yeah, those are... Uh, those are his big uh, ones, Thicko. Right? Thicko, yeah. Yeah. Anyone has a guess there, but congratulations to JJ the Boss. <laughs> Got a 1.48... Uh, one to 4.85 payout on that. So congratulations on your victory. Yeah, no guesses in chat. The answer is Fahrenheit 9-11. It grossed $119 million, which for a documentary is astounding. Yeah, yeah. Because production costs aren't that high. Right. Like, that's right. that's amazing. And that was um, a response to the Iraq War, right? It was mm -hmm. right post 9-11 and then the Iraq War. Uh, Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So I was I bowling for Columbine. That came out before that. That was like two thousand one, something like that. Yeah, maybe even mid late nineties. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing that one in the theater because it was like Columbine was I think ninety eight. It was shortly after that. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought that was just brilliant. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's some biases related to it and things like that. But I mean, the storytelling it was engaging. People saw it like. Did it make a difference, as far as we can tell in the U.S.? No. Well, oh, well, right. I mean, that's a really sad subject matter, right? Yeah. If, you, if you think about um, that film and 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 how much attention it got, and mm -hmm. and and that it really was um, very successful economically and cult had a big cultural impact. But then fast forward to Uvalde, and and which is almost thirty years later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's tragic, and and so. Yes, you know, uh, Michael Moore absolutely has a point of view, and that's um, and in the documentary world, that's that's okay. You know, documentaries are not intended to be objective; mm -hmm. they're not they're not meant to be neutral. There, and, and and you know Michael Moore's point of view from the beginning, so you can assess whether you whether he he convinces you with his argument or not. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, he might not be convincing to you, but um, but his goal is not to not to be objective. His goal is to present a persuasive visual essay mm -hmm. and um and that's where you know that's it's a whole genre within the documentary tradition so my question for you andy i just used google foo and looked this up do you know what the second large grossing documentary i'm is? gonna say march of the penguins you are correct okay. 777 million dollars and number three, Justin Bieber never said never. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a contrasting subject. Matter. Yes, yes. And the uh, the public has a wide range of tastes, and that's okay. That's what we like pluralism, right? It's yeah. a, we're a diverse society, and that's that's what's important is is you know learning from each other and and recognizing each other's differences. Like that's that's what makes the world great. And um, you know, if we were all the same, it'd be a pretty boring place. So. So an inconvenient truth was number eleven on this list. I'm surprised that's not higher. I yeah, and and, and and I know, and and for a while it it it, it was higher. Mm. Um, I think Justin Bieber. Uh, <laughs> I suppose since 2006, it's been quite a few. Yeah. And Katy Perry, in One Direction, Chimpanzee, Earth, Oof, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, Michael Jackson. This is it. I know. Well, that that 2000 Mules has sure caused a lot of. Um, yeah. Had a lot of social impact because you know it's part of the election denial uh, mm -hmm. effort, and there's a lot of people that that cite that as uh, you know as influential to them. And oh, this is nice. Number twelve is "Won't You Be My Neighbor," the uh, Mr. Yeah, Rogers yeah. documentary. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an amazing film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then they went on to do the fictional piece. Um, 
with, with Tom Hanks. So, so let's let's follow up the numbers with just a. I, this is probably a very hard question to answer, but what's what's your all time favorite documentary? Oh, this well, uh, you know, I, I thought this question might come up, and I was thinking, I was uh, being old school and looking at my shelf of uh, DVDs <laughs> in my office the other day, and I I still go back to the the, the trilogy that really. Um, hooked me in were, were the um, Paradise Lost trilogy. So it's about the West Memphis Three. And these films were made, the three films were made over, I'm going to say over a 20-year period or close to it. And it's the only trilogy in Hollywood that... Um, <laughs> That that doesn't have special effects, <laughs> but but uh, but was still and and is a, and is a true story, and so the three uh, there were these three goth teenagers who were accused of some really awful murders, and uh, were pro you know um, ended up found guilty in kind of a rush to judgment during part of the satanic panic that was going on. Uh, I'm going to say late eighties. What were the dates? Early so the, 90s. The documentary was 1996. Okay, yep. So the, and, and the murders, I think, were shortly before that. So it's... Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Berlinger, what's, what's his first name, the director? Oh, Joe, Joe Berlinger, Berlinger, yeah. And so... Um, and then by the third one, so, you know, spoiler alert, um, they get <laughs> they get exonerated after spending spending a long time in prison. Um, Jeez. They, they end up getting getting out, but it's this really strange way that they were released. Through. They were released under an Alfred plea, which um, uh, is 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 some way that you you then are prevented from suing the state for wrongful, uh, you know, for in a civil suit, and that there's, you know, it's a, it's a it's a very strange legal um, maneuver that mm -hmm. happened. Um, and this is all captured in the documentary. Yeah, in the, the three the films, and you really go back and forth, feeling like, oh, that guy is so guilty. Oh no, that person's so guilty. Like the characters are just unbelievable. Um, oh, yeah. But then, um, and and in a way, we've seen this uh, that that kind of true crime series has has kind of exploded in the in, in the last twenty five years since those films began. Yeah, um, on YouTube, it's huge right now. Uh -huh. yeah, all this true crime stuff. Yeah. Uh, but but that, but those three films I, I think are, are are particularly interesting um, in the ways that in, in in what they're telling us about the American justice system yeah. about class not so much about race because it's you know they're white kids and it's a white community so but it's a it's a very class based story mm -hmm. um, and and West Memphis is a very uh, impoverished uh, um, part of the world. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's a combination of the storytelling, subject matter, how they deliver it. Like it's just it's and, and the characters that then that that are clearly performing for the film. Yeah. You know, so in science, right? You you all either you talk about either the Heisenberg principle or you talk about the Hawthorne effect, maybe where of uh, well, the Heisenberg principle is. Uh, uh, you want me to elaborate? Yeah, yeah. Heisenberg is you can't know position and momentum at the same time is the fundamental. <laughs> it's basically uncertainty in details of how things exist. <laughs> and that helps. And and then and then the Hawthorne effect is um is that uh, people change their behavior if they know they're being observed. Yeah, yeah. So I think those two things combined, like the uncertainty with then the um the altering of behavior, like you see that in those in both those dynamics taking place in the films. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, really and, and characters who you, you couldn't script them. If you scripted them, uh, nobody would, would would believe it, um, but in yeah. But, but the fact that they're they're actual people who who are then um, you know there, there is a sense of performance for the camera, uh, but um, so I'm going to contrast your really like in depth heartfelt analysis of a real thing with my favorite documentary, which is King of Kong Fistful of Quarters. Oh, uh, Have you seen that? Uh, no. Oh my God! It yeah. is. It's so. For those of you not familiar, this is a documentary about people competing for the world record in Donkey Kong, <laughs> and it is. I, I again, the subject matter is absurd, but I mean, it's people passionate about the things they want to do, and I encourage that. I support that, but it's also Donkey Kong. But like, it's exactly <laughs> like you said. It's like the characters are so like you couldn't come up with a better bad guy, and you couldn't uh, come uh, up with uh, a better good guy. Yeah, yeah. I I would really love for you to watch that one. I'd be curious on your perspective. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I've heard about it, and and have, have it's it's on my list. I, I need to get back to it for sure. Yeah. Um. Because <laughs> JJ, a, make sure he watches that. In a similar <laughs> in a similar genre. Um, Air Guitar Nation. Yep. <laughs> the competition. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Bad. The best part about the the Donkey Kong King uh, uh, Fistful of Quarters is that the, the bad guy in it, he's recently had his world records revoked for cheating. <laughs> so there's oh, a really? twist post documentary. Oh, how, yeah. how can you cheat? Uh, it, it was basically he he's cheated after that. Like his original records were probably real, but because he cheated afterwards, they like retroactively removed him from leaderboards. And there's all sorts of lawsuits going on. So, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a really dramatic thing. You can check it out on YouTube. There's a whole whole bunch of his name is Billy Mitchell, and so it's it's a really compelling story. <laughs> Playing with Thyme, I'm adding this to my doc list now. Yes, you you definitely should. Uh, Paradise Lost and <laughs> King of Kong, Fistful of Quarters. Both of them sound intriguing. Uh, Fire and Ice, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining us. Throw your questions in chat. I, me and Andy will shoot the shit all night. We're happy to, but if there's things you guys want to know about documentary filmmaking, theory... Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start with one on the theory end of documentaries. There's a lot of, like, I've, I've watched a lot of movies. In undergrad, I actually did a movie review show with one of my friends. Uh -huh. kind of, oh, nice. he, was, he was a mass comm major, and he did it for the local, you know, TV show. Um, but uh, so I've seen thousands. I think I'm up to 6,000 on Netflix. But there's, there's some classic cliches in, in most filmmaking. But what are the cliches in documentary filmmaking? What are the, the, the good ones and the bad ones? Uh, well, I... Um the 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 I, well I don't know so much cliches as um you know the, the, I think there's different different modes or you know you've got the on camera protagonist right Michael Moore who's going around trying to solve um, solve a mystery solve a problem um, and 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 understand something uh, you've got um, you got an expository tradition where where the voice of God tells the viewer what they you know what to think about a topic, and and does does a fair amount of explaining, and that's that tends to be more like Ken Burns, um, and and then uh, and then you've got kind of you know you uh, interesting thing of you, you got animation documentary right people and 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 more and more reenactments are, are happening in documentary. They really started with Errol Morris. In his film, a thin blue line mm. uh, from the 1980s, yeah, and and that and after that film, he exonerated a death row inmate uh, through the making of that film. He he ended up finding, uh, you know, uh, uncovering the, the truth about a, a, a murder of a police officer. So, um, so you know, I don't, I, I'm not so much answering your question about about uh, cliches, and cliches, yeah, yeah, yeah. but. Um, but more, but more about kind of stylistic approaches yeah. and, um, and the ways those impact the storytelling. Um, well, so I guess I'll frame that another way. So like in the sciences, I have a question I ask, like what is the flat earth anti-vax equivalent in your discipline? Uh, For you, there's just some, some don't do's in, in filmmaking, you know, like yeah, yeah. Well, what, what, are, what are the ones that you see that just make you cringe? Is there, is there a, an amateur oh, like, um, in films? What, what is the don't do the, the, the don't do a documentary mm -hmm. i mean there's obviously a lot of degrees in freedom but there are some yeah well and uh, i mean i i don't i don't like films that um that tell you what to think so i you know i, I like films that that present lots of points of view mm -hmm. and, and leave it up to the viewer to decide i see who, who they who, who they believe and um and and that's empowering the viewer so i so simple answers and um and simple solutions i think are always suspect mm -hmm. and um uh well my new vocabulary word that i learned just the other day is um uh let's see if i can remember it uh uh monoclause ataxophilia <laughs> uh, which is uh the belief that there's only one answer um to to a given problem uh and and it's um and you see a lot of uh a lot of that kind of thinking uh these days where oh it's all you know oh it was a stolen election oh it's all you know it's it's the rich and their um you know their luxury jets that are the problem with climate change or um uh <laughs> 
coined by Ernest Popple as a joke, but picked up and popularized by others. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that is, that's the vocabulary word of the day. Monocausal tactophilia. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Uh, and that, that I, I picked that up from the book, um, uh, um, sh shoot, why am I blanking on it now? Um, uh, I'll think of it. No Sorry. worries. <laughs> no worries. You're yeah, under pressure yeah, playing yeah, Quake. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been keeping track. How's it going? I, I made it out of the little eddy that I was stuck in. And now, I, uh, now I'm, uh, you know, I, I got to say the God mode really helps. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it takes the pressure off. Right? Right, right, right. You can focus on conversations. And what, I, what I love about gaming is like if you're murdering something, you're going the right direction. I think the rules are pretty straightforward. <laughs> Uh, Reese's Pieces had a follow-up on Billy Mitchell. He probably also ch cheated on his original records. They went in a room by themselves. He was friends with the judges. Man, that's tragic if that's true. Um, okay, so that the, the book that I was going to refer to is called Ministry of the Future Ministry um, of by Kim Stanley Robinson. And it is a climate fiction book. Uh, but it, it's so great because he moves back and forth between... Um, uh, between the, a narrative story and some real hard data about what's going on with climate and 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 the climate crisis and 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 various um, kind of goes after some of the fallacies you know there's all these these arguments oh you know there's there's got to be there's got we have to have a lot of poor people on the planet there's just not enough resources to feed everybody or or you know kind of these these normative assumptions that that animate so much of our um, uh, our, our our background assumptions about the world he he takes apart and he takes them apart with data and and so in in, in i think it's chapter 20 mm. is particularly good with that uh and that's where the monoclausal taxophilia comes in <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome yeah. somebody formalized it i'm sure it has latin roots i don't know all of them <laughs> stumble bear this is awesome stumble bear thank you for the follow thank you for joining us with their 300 standard in internet units they have immediately requested a factoid okay like, do you want right. to drop one of your knowledge bombs <laughs> i mean we have several i mean these are pretty fun basic income yeah, EPA. Uh, oh, so so uh, uh, a betting question or a, um, no? No, no they just drop knowledge bombs on Okay, the All right. well, um, it's going to be hard to believe, and you're, you're probably going to want to go look this up, but it was actually a Republican who created the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and uh, not just any Republican, but the infamous Richard Nixon. So in 1969... Uh, and and so okay so in in in, in the early seventies he created the Environmental Protection Agency the Clean Air Act the Clean Water Act the Endangered Species Act and NEPA which is the National uh, Environmental Protection Act which is the cornerstone of environmental policy in the federal government so um, this shows that uh, our current divided. Uh, government hostility toward um by by the current republic formation of the republican party hostility toward environmental protection toward uh, discussion of climate um climate science um all of that is is has a very different historical pattern and, and roots and um so so i think it's really uh you know it's an important um important piece of history to remember that that the the current ways that our political parties are configured are temporary and and that and that and that it's an, and that I think there's a lot of reason why we might want to think about going back to where we have two parties who both recognize social problems and have different ways of solving them but mm -hmm. that we we sit down at the table and we talk about solving those problems from different perspectives instead of um kind of one party pretending that climate change isn't happening and, yeah. uh, you, you know like that that's not going to get us anywhere right it's really not so um well it goes back to monocauso taxophilia <laughs> yeah. right like blame them for all the problems and then blame the other people there is a middle ground ladies and gentlemen it's not necessarily, it's, and, and, it's and not it, necessarily in the middle, <laughs> but it's somewhere in. Well, the and, and then it comes. It's it's a dialectic. It comes through just deliberation and debate and discussion. Uh -huh. It comes through the, the 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 answers come from that process. It's the process that is really important and that has been the the cornerstone of the American political decision making process 
four, two, you know, 200 and whatever, however long we are now, 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, but it has to be an honest dialogue. It has to be like intent has to be there to compromise. And, yeah. and, and, to, and, and, to, and good faith negotiation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and that then, and, and when that's present, then, then we saw incredible things happen. You know, we saw, uh, the the creation of 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 this of these environmental policies that have protected animals and plants and has protected our clean water in most places except for Flint Michigan or Jackson Mississippi um, you know some of the places that are that are having real problems with their public drinking water but like in Tallahassee and and in places all around Florida and all around the country our, our water is protected because of the Clean Water Act um, Richard and, Nixon. And, and Richard Thank Nixon, Nixon. Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon, thank for it. Yeah, yeah. So, raise, so, raise your glass cheers, to Jer cheers. Richard. <laughs> cheers. Uh, even Richard Nixon has got soul, right? That's a Neil Young quote from the song <laughs> "Campaigner." Um, uh, I like it. It's underappreciated. It's, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things. It's easy to vilify people in history, but he did do some good things. And this is something I talk about with my Gen Chem students regularly. Like, you are very, very happy the EPA exists. Like, you do not understand how bad this could actually be. And we saw it. We saw it with, you know, the pollution in the air and acid rain and CFCs heating the ozone. And, it, 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 yeah, we have historic documentation of all this. And on that ozone question, that is a good example of where international cooperation happened and worked, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's try this. Um, we don't have it written down, but we can ask. All right. Um, what do you want to ask? Oh, uh, well, oh, because it has to be a yes or no, right? Or, it has or, two or, options, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, never mind. This is just a factoid then. All right. Um, okay, Montreal Protocol. Mm -hmm. um, that is what uh, the global agreement that stopped the production of chlorofluorocarbons and their mass production and use, they were, it was a propellant in aerosols used in everything from underarm deodorant to hairspray. And um, and the, the, there was a global agreement to roll back the use and production of chlorofluorocarbon. And everyone at first was like, oh, no, what are we going to do? How could we possibly have hairspray or deodorant if we don't have these propellants um, that are going up and causing? They were major, uh, had a major impact on the, the hole in the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough. Innovation solved uh, how to uh, get your hairspray and your air and your underarm deodorant on without chlorofluorocarbons, and the ozone hole shrunk, and we had international progress. So you know the economy didn't collapse, people didn't go back to living in caves, and um and, and we and we solved the problem. Mm -hmm. So so international agreements can happen and it can work. You know China and India didn't cheat their way out of it, which is, you know, the, one of the big accusations around the climate negotiations. Oh, these other countries are going to cheat. Well, you know, we, we, we've seen it work in the past and it can happen again. So mm -hmm. you got to remember, that's why history is good to, to, to have a handle on. That's back to my earlier point about range, about you can't just be a, a chemist or just be a musician or just be a, a documentary filmmaker. you gotta you got to read broadly and, 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 and think because... Uh, you know, these things are connected, right? History and science and politics, economics. So, so on a related note, I guess, I guess I have two questions. What's your favorite environmental documentary and what's, what do you think is the most impactful one? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, well, okay. On the first question, um, I'm going to say, well, uh, hmm. Yeah, it's hard because I've uh, I've seen a lot. Of, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe go with Gasland. Gasland, um, that's a fun. One. Because it, it really mm -hmm. it, it it drew attention to fracking in a way that the mainstream media had not um, had not fully mm -hmm. uh, addressed. And uh, so, Gasland is your favorite or uh, more impactful? Um, I'm gonna say okay. Because then I'm going to have to try and remember uh, my other, <laughs> other environmental docs that... <laughs> no oh, worries. well, okay. Um, so, yes, you're right. I'm going to say that as most impactful. Okay. Then, then um, uh, favorite is... Um, oh, uh, I'll remember the name. It's about... Um, it's, it's, oh, uh, it's about... Uh, um, Butte, Montana, and um, and Travis Wilkerson is the filmmaker. Uh, um, 
and, and I can't believe I'm blanking on this name because it's one an of, injury to uh, one. An injury to one. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> no so, um, so an injury to one is fantastic because it uh, it tells the story of Frank Little, who was a union, a wobbly organizer in um, in uh, the 1920s, trying to um, uh, organize the mine workers in Montana, and and he was killed. Um, and but what that what that film does is it, it connects environmental history, labor history, mm. um, both of which uh, have been kind of written out of of a lot of our American history classes and and kind of general understanding. Mm -hmm. So so the Wobblies, you know, they were an effort to try and unionize all workers around the world, and and push back. And this was at a time of, of, of real exploitation of, of miners and, and, and other industries. And, um, and, and then this, and it launched uh, the Pinkerton raids and the Alien and Sedition Act, um, all to try and stop this unionization movement. And uh, so, so his story, and then it was connected to this very large mine that was um, a copper mine in Butte, Montana, that now has become uh, copper mines, they dig big holes and, and now the hole is filled with water and the water is so toxic that, um, that it kills bird life when they land in it. So the story starts with this flock of geese that are forced to land in, um, uh, in, uh, during a storm and they, um, and they all die. And so it starts with this question, well, why did these geese die? Um, oh. um, and uh, and and the geese, and then and then it, uh, it unpacks why the geese died, and it traces it back. And and the, so the geese died in the current. You know, in, the film was made in two thousand two, so in you know turn of the, right around the turn of the twenty first century. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, um, the 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 reason they died goes back almost a hundred years, and. Um, uh, and 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 then has connection to the First World War because the reason the mine uh, they were needing so much copper was um, because of uh, the need for copper during the First World War, um, and and so uh, connecting the dots then between labor and environment and and uh, you know military uh, adventures in, uh, overseas is. Um, Is again another uh, another way to uh, you know that, that I think it's important to connect what um, you know our, our, our histories and um, and and our, our ecological history and our and our social and cultural history and, and economic history. So, so you should be able to change weapons in this. I got to imagine you've gotten. Oh, I do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, I see. I can. Uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and I think it has been changing, but then I run out of bullets of a given... Uh, oh, really? God mode doesn't give you infinite? Okay. Uh, what a ripoff. If I'm God, I want infinite bullets. <laughs> okay, uh, so there we go. I completed, completed a level. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 50-48. Not a speed... Should we find out what the speed run time of this is? <laughs> speed run... What is the, what's your guess for the fastest run of this game? Um, uh, uh, of level one. Oh man. Wow. On easy, they've beaten the entire game in 11 minutes, 47 seconds. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. The, the entire game. The entire game, level. not the first level. No. The entire game. Well. You can do it on nightmare 100% in one hour and five minutes, which is incredible. All right, well, let's try a little, let's try, you know, you Maybe Galaga or, or yeah, we can we can or? switch to Galaga. Okay, that should be pretty easy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going way back to Galaga, one of the earliest arcade games. This goes back to my early days making pizza and working next to a next to a um, an arcade up in New Hampshire, Weirs Beach, New Hampshire. If you've ever been up there. sound out of that all right but hold on my left and right to, uh, oh is press it, start uh, it oh, might, oh, it might right. be oh, it might go. be the animation there we go. There we yep go. 
Let's start again. There we go. There, there we go. There we go. <laughs> That's back, right. ladies and gentlemen. Press the button. <laughs> Yeah, anyone just joining us, ask a scientist gaming, mediocre gameplay, expert science. I guess science in this case is uh, science of the communication, particularly through a documentary format. So if you guys have any questions, Dr. Andy Opal is happy to answer them. Talking about uh, documentaries, theory, um, yeah, concepts behind them, his favorite documentaries. We've visited many topics so far. If you guys have any questions, feel free to throw those in chat. Um, I guess we should do another prediction. We're about an hour in. Um, what do you want to do? I'm going to let you decide because I can't take my eyes off. <laughs> Don't worry, you already have infinite lives. So you are you are God mode in Galaga as well. Oh, I'm no, 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 let's, let's, let's not do that. No. Well, I mean, you, you can count three lives, you'll be dead. Because <laughs> it, it, it carries over once you <laughs> once you enter God mode in any, in any game. Then. Oh man, should we do... Let's do a... Let's do a nature environmental one. This one's kind of fun. All yeah, right. this is this is this was one of the first games I, I spent much time on working after making pizza and fried dough and get, go over to the arcade and, and waste all your pay all my hard earned money. Exactly. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna put up a prediction. If you're not following, click the follow button. Use your standard internet units. We're going to use them for a prediction here. What percent of untreated wastewater goes back into the ecosystem? As in, after we use it, after it gets dirty, how much of it just goes back into the ecosystem without being treated? And treated means purifi purification and cleaning and all sorts of stuff. What percent of our wastewater globally goes back into the ecosystem without being treated? Is it less than 50% or greater than 50%? As in, out of every gallon of water, how much is it? Half of it or more or less? that goes back into the ecosystem without being treated in any way. And this is globally, right? That's... Yes, yes, yeah, so, yep. Yeah. These are global, global stats. Yep, so bet your internet points now, click that predict button. Um, again, ask a scientist gaming honor code. You can't look up the answer, just do your prediction now. Depending on your confidence, you can put a whole lot of money on it or not money, imaginary internet units that don't mean anything. <laughs> So yeah, throw your predictions in there now. You have about a minute, so put your prediction in now. I mean, so so in inherent to what you do. So I do a lot of um, like press releases on a lot of our science, just because of visibility and things like that. And I re work with FSU's PR office and Kathleen Hogney, and she's she's yep. pretty good. Yep. And she has to learn a lot of the science. Yep. I mean, so how much have you learned? through this process of documentary making like how much homework do you have to do to put together a story like this oh yeah well it's always that's what's great about uh being a documentary filmmaker is you, you do deep dives mm -hmm. on on the subjects that you're that you're working on yeah and um and i think oh uh okay so there well there i did use up my lives did it yep oh okay. yeah um yeah so uh you, you know, this is, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is one of the things I think we really need um, is more collaboration at FSU and, and in general between scientists and, and filmmakers and storytellers. You know, it's part of the part of the problem. It's part of the reason we've got so many people who are skeptical about climate science is because there's they're, they're not getting good stories. Right. People understand stories. They don't understand data. Right, and so, um, mm -hmm. so we need partnerships between the arts and filmmakers and and the scientists, you know, to really to help uh, help audiences understand the complexity of the world we're living in. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, it, it, there's absolutely a, um, a, a a deep relationship that has to happen between the the artists and and the scientists. Mm -hmm. um, We've been working, I've been working with a group at Co-Ops, uh, which is the Center for Oceanographic and Atmospheric Prediction Studies mm -hmm. at FSU, Eric Chassanet. And, um, and uh, he's got a model, he and his team have a model, the marine debris uh, model, which shows where... Uh, um, shows where plastic goes once it gets in the ocean. Mm. And... Um, 
And we've been working with uh, with NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and and Eric and his team to develop some uh, videos about this marine debris model. Mm -hmm. And that has been a really interesting process uh, because uh, you know trying to the scientists want to make sure the the visuals and the data are accurate. Mm -hmm. The government bureaucrats want to make sure the claims fit within the policy initiatives of the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Ian Weir and I, he's a, he's a filmmaker in the film school and we've collaborated on a lot of projects. So we're, we're kind of on the creative side. Um, we're trying to make things look good and sound good and and be compelling to mm -hmm. audiences mm -hmm. and um and it's really challenging to do that kind of um that kind of work because uh because of the different you know different constituencies um mm -hmm. and 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 trying to balance all those forces but but it's essential you know it's really it's really one of the things that's missing um in uh, i think both at fsu and within our uh, you know, nice. within the culture at, at large, I think is is a siloing of of skill sets, and that and that we need we need more multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary collaborations to to help to help translate the, the data into things people can understand, and and that not only that they can understand, but that they can emotionally understand, um, and that, where they feel something, mm -hmm. um, and they feel moved, uh, um, and because when people feel emotional connections to things. They're much more likely to act. Um, so, uh, so I think these, you know, getting bring together diver, different teams, bring the artists and the scientists into the same room, working on on together. I, I think is really. Oh, 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 oh. Boyd. Oh, okay, I, uh, fighter okay. Catch, I, I thought I could get in there and get him. No, nope, I'd forgotten. All right. I think you can get him back though. Uh -huh. Oh, I can get him back. Oh, right, right. Okay. That's good. If I don't, if I don't destroy him. Oh, I didn't destroy him. I think. Yeah, I, I don't remember the rules on this. Yeah. yeah. No, I. Because yeah, what? Because what, what are your thoughts about trying to collaborate with with, you know, like when you're talking about those press releases and because communicating science is a really you know, is, is, a, is a complicated endeavor. It is. And, and one of the hard parts in it, and I'm, I'm clearly into science outreach. Like I have pretty polished responses to answers to questions, but one of the hard things science deals with in this is that there is, there's always a qualifier. And this is something that works against us as scientists and yeah. what the anti-science movement does. It's like scientists aren't sure. And that is a universally true statement. And we can't be, it's yeah. impossible for us to be based on scientific method. We can say within a reasonable doubt, this is the answer, but no one will go on camera and say, this is the answer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So and, and, and Naomi Oresi's uh, book and subsequent uh, documentary, Merchants The Merchants of Doubt. Of doubt. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So just what you said, doubt is the, is the tra is the the currency of science denial yeah, yeah. And, um, and 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 it has been for a long time they did it around tobacco they're doing it around climate um they've done it they did it around covid vaccines um yeah it's uh and 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 because exactly because science is um cautious in your claims um it it it, it, it creates it's fertile ground then for that that denial yeah yeah if you if you guys haven't read this book merchants of doubt and it's a documentary i haven't seen that as well but yeah it's awesome it, yeah, it's i mean the book is amazing it breaks down how basically any science denial that's happened in the last hundred years has been the same think tank essentially everything from tobacco to ozone hole to climate change to all of it was the same people so, and, and it's a public message. relations firm in washington dc and it is also a lobbying group yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> cuddle puppy would like to buy five doubts <laughs> merchants of doubt <laughs> Uh, Cuddle Puppy, welcome back. Thank you for joining us in the stream. <laughs> Cuddle Puppy just got here, wants to know Dr. Opal's favorite handful of documentaries. Um, we touched on it earlier, but short answer, what, what's your list? What's your top five? Well, um, uh, it's always changing based on uh, <laughs> what I've seen recently or, or, or what I can remember. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, uh, well, okay, you, you know, instead of just talking about, you know, what I, one film I like a lot is um, is Bitter Seventy, and, and it's another environmental doc, but it's and it's about um, 
a, an activist who went in and bid on some oil well leases, even though he didn't have the money to actually drill on the leases um, or pay for them. But it was, you know, it was an act of civil disobedience. And then, um, and then uh, was was put in prison for it. Um, actually, uh, but but it's a it's a, it's a fascinating story of um, an attempt to draw attention to the role of fossil fuels in the climate crisis, the role of the federal government and leasing of public lands for fossil fuel extraction. Um, so, you know, it's one of these backdoor stories that um, where, oh, uh, you know, you you end up learning uh, 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 about um, about a complex issue through a per very personal um individual story so so that's that's one i like a lot um yeah but i always struggle with that that favorite question yeah, because, yeah. Um, that's tough there, and there's just so much good King work Gizzard. out there and the, the genre has exploded um you know the documentary genre is just so so rich it's you know we did not solve our prediction. So, uh, percent of untreated wastewater back to the ecosystem. Andy, what is the answer? Greater than 50% or less than 50%? Unfortunately, it's greater. A lot greater. A lot greater. Where's the number you had here? 70%, I believe. 80%. According to United Nations, 80% of the world's wastewater flows back into the ecosystem without being treated or reused. Wow. Approximately 44% of household wastewater isn't safe to treat, isn't safely treated across the globe. Yeah, that was eye-opening. When I went to China, it would have been 2015. In the hotel room, there was a little sign that said, the water is drinkable, but we wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I'm like, that's an interesting pitch. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's uh, and that's troubling because... Um... You know, we all need water, and and not only do we need water, but you know, so do so does wildlife, so do our crops that we end up eating in one form or another. Um, you know, it's a it, 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 we're on a closed loop ecosystem, right? And mm -hmm. and and we don't think like that. We we still so much of our thinking is linear, where we think of extraction, uh, extraction, crashing, and disposal. And, you know, I, I, I often argue that there is no such thing as disposal. It, it doesn't exist. The word shouldn't even exist. It's a it's a it's a fake concept because it, you can Going somewhere you can move it. You can relocate it, but it is not gone. It is not disposed of. And every other system on the planet is one of renewal where where the waste of one thing becomes the, the food of another. And and. Uh, when we think in a linear model, in a in a certain a closed system, uh, I think it's it, it is a foundation for uh, for problems. Yeah, in the in the hard sciences, we call that conservation of mass because it doesn't disappear, <laughs> right. right? Like energy, not created or destroyed, it's going somewhere. How do you bookkeep that? Cuddle puppy. How did the poop do documentary filmmakers get their funding? <laughs> the poop do what? Um, I don't know. I don't know that I saw that one. Um, but uh, funding for documentary is always a challenge. Uh, yeah. You know, it really is. And but Netflix and um and and even and, and YouTube and Amazon have all uh you know opened up new possibilities that, that didn't exist. You know, ten years ago. Um, <laughs> is this is this poop the documentary? Is that what you're talking about? There's also flush the documentary. Wow, I did not think this was a. So I like to do real time Google. Yeah, searches. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. no. Oh man. But anyway, back to the wastewater treatment. That's eighty percent goes back in. I mean, that's that's going to be contrasted depending on what continent you're on and what system but that and, well and and as we know within what municipality you know because like mm -hmm. what's going on in jackson mississippi right now you've got a city of 180,000 people um that that does not have uh, um clean drinking water and hasn't and and i think it's unlikely that they're gonna get it anytime soon uh the infrastructure has been so bad and that it's it's a clear case of environmental racism uh and um and where the the state of mississippi uh 
although allocated lots of federal dollars for, for water treatment, for public water supply, did not allocate to the city of Jackson because the city of Jackson is a predominantly African-American city. And, um, and so it was, it was denied um, upgrades and maintenance that would have prevented this current crisis. So it's really, um, you know, it's really tragic. And I think we're likely to see some, some very powerful documentary work come out about this situation here. Uh, uh, that, that started about six months ago now and, and uh, is is ongoing and, and happening in real time. Is this a documentary called Shit? Is that what you're saying, Cuddle Puppy? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, you can post a link if you find the IMDb page. Cuddle Puppy, you are VIP approved, so feel free to post a link. <laughs> that is intriguing. Oh, man. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> this is an 18 plus stream. We'll spare all we want. <laughs> so, there was a question a while back. JJ the boss, I have a feeling this is going to induce a rant. This might be one of your kids. What are your opinions on Elon Musk buying Twitter? Oh. <laughs> well, it's been a lot about Elon Musk. I can say that much. Like, he, he's getting a lot of attention. Um, and, and the old adage uh, uh, all publicity is good publicity. Uh, so maybe there's some uh, silver lining in it for him, but I think it's, you know, the biggest takeaway for me is just what it reveals about uh, our, our media system and, and, and the, the way our media system is structured and the fact that we can have the, uh, the richest person on the planet um, owning a really powerful media tool and then, and then manipulating it so transparently um, is is not is not a good uh, sign for or, or model for for how uh, democratic societies fun flourish. Um, you know, I think uh, we need we need more non-commercial outlets. We need more publicly owned uh, media outlets. You know, the fact that every you know we're down to five major media corporations that own every. Film stu major film studio, television station, um, production house, book publishing, internet website, like globally, and um, and that 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 so there was a, a book called The Media Monopoly published by Ben Bagdicki, and and he first when he first wrote the book, um, and he was a scholar at the University of California Berkeley, uh, he was worried about 50 companies owning all the the major media outlets, and now we're down to five, yeah. and he's had to keep revising it. And so um, the concentration of power in, is 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 not uh, is not conducive to to demo to democracies and um, and to, and to tr transparency and accountability and these are the corner you know key elements of, of functioning democracy. So uh, I think you know the Elon Musk example is just the latest in a long series of um, examples where. You know, Corporate owned, like large entities, are are owning and manipulating uh, public information sources, and 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 there's and there's all kinds of fallout. Um. <laughs> my favorite part of the diatribe was during that my night bot automatically puts my social media links up there for Ask a Scientist. So yeah, click that link, follow us on Twitter. <laughs> So we're still going to use the medium because that's the nature of the beast. Oh man. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's one of those things I debate. Like it's, is it morally reprehensible that I'm involved, but I am cause that's what, you know, my community communicates through that means. Well, and no, it's a really powerful tool. A lot of people yeah. are refusing to abandon it because, because it's such a powerful tool and, 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 and rightly so. But that, but that's it speaks even more to where we need, we need some public ownership of this type of tool and public ownership where we're not data mined uh, uh, for every one of our clicks. And that, and that if we are, if we choose to be data mined, if we choose to give up some of our, um, our online personas and portfolios and, 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 and then, but we get to choose which parts and, and we also get to monetize ourselves. Like why, why are, are our, uh, profiles, which are the value that Twitter makes is when people look at it. This is true of all media, mm -hmm. right? The value of the media is when we pay attention. So our our attention is valuable. So we should be earning a fractional share of this. And this is, you know, these are theorists, Jared Lanier and other futurists have been talking about this, how we need, you know, publicly uh, operated 
for platforms and we also need uh, a, oh, a digital bill of rights where we're, we're granted access to know what um, what the algorithm knows about us and we can choose okay yes you know what I did I looked for um, I looked for diabetes medication but I want to take that out because I don't want everyone to know that I might be pre-diabetic or, or or any a number of other personal health or or, or choice issues right um, and, and that we should have control over these things and it shouldn't be a black box that is then monetized um, by by external sources um, so uh, and, and and so it, the, these can the conditions are not inevitable we, we have the ability to alter these media systems, um, but we have to pay attention to it. It has to be on the political agenda. We have to talk about it. We have to call for media reform. We have to acknowledge that there are other ways of structuring our media system. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that we don't have to take, you know, what we have and, and accept, oh, this is, this is all, this is the best we can have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the British, they have a fixed tax on um, on media devices that then helps to fund the BBC and the BBC and so it can't be chipped away at every legislative session uh, um, where and, and argued over oh PBS I didn't like their coverage of my political campaign so I'm going to cut the funding for PBS well the BBC is able to get around that because because they have a fixed funding source that comes through the taxation of, of the fixed tax, taxation of media devices like televisions and radios. Um, creates a steady funding stream and and the BBC is is considered a very credible news source uh, you know it still has very status status quo uh, agenda for the most part but it but but it's better than a lot of uh, commercially driven media in the US so yeah, I'm genuinely curious I haven't looked into it like BBC's coverage of like the royal family like is that does it have to be intrinsically biased just to the nature of the system, or is it is it actually fair uh, coverage? Uh, right. Well, and that's and that's a good question. And I wonder. I'm sure there's some comparison studies out there. Yeah. yeah. Of, of their, uh, their their coverage, because um, there's certainly you know really some of the best international news coverage yeah, yeah. Uh, that, yep. that that we currently have in in the Western world. Um, oh uh, wow! I did not think it had that range. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was getting out of the way of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's intriguing. So so going back to the, the, the science and documentary and, and bridging those gaps, do you have student projects that you assigned during? Did, like, your students have to make documentaries? Or is that... Uh, yes, well, I have I have taught documented classes. Oh, there we go. Um, where, so I've done a number of things where sometimes I teach a documentary class where students work in small groups uh, but then I've also done collaborative projects where um, one was called the Apalachicola River Project, mm -hmm. where we had um, Bill Landing from EOS, uh, one of our eminent um, oceanographers, uh, uh, along with um, a, a couple of other scholars from other disciplines, uh, were all collaborating on um, a, a, a multidisciplinary effort to understand what was going on with the Apalachicola River. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that was... Um, you know, very topic focused. Um, uh, you know, I would like to see something similar based around the climate crisis. Uh, the University of Barcelona is now having a required class uh, for all their students on the climate crisis mm. uh, to understand, because I think um, people, they're still not really good understanding of, of what's happening and what's at stake. I think there's a lot of discussion of, of CO2 Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's it's clearly only one, uh, you know, one of the of the aspects of, of what's going on with, with the climate crisis. So so um, that that program there's a really nice article recently from uh, the Guardian about um, what, what what they're doing at the University of Barcelona, uh, and I think it'd be nice to see something like that at FSU. I think we need a certain amount of climate literacy as as a part of our curriculum. I, I think. You know, again, we can't be graduating people, I think, without a certain amount of literacy about what is going on. Uh, and 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 I and and I would also like to see it kind of integrated across the board because it certainly affects economics. Mm -hmm. it, oh, it affects, um, you know, there, there's cultural implications for for the social sciences. Uh, there's, there's clearly migratory patterns that are shifting. Oh, you know, big biological and chemical changes. 
Speaking of which, I have a science question for you. This is something we covered in class today. Are you familiar with ocean acidification? Absolutely. Okay, so you're familiar with the phenomenon. Yeah, and I think uh, and, that's and, an and underspoken. The pods. Yeah, that's um, a very underspoken aspect of climate change is ocean acidification. Everyone talks about temperature, but other things happen when you have CO2 in the air. Right, changing the 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 acidity of seawater. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is it's, uh, right, and you can, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know it, problem. <laughs> right? well, and it, it has a pro it creates a problem for shellfish yep. to create their shells and it erodes the calcium that protects shellfish. And, and our smallest shellfish at the very bottom of the food chain, yep. one of the species called pteropods, right? Or is yep. a group cluster of species. And pteropods have a very thin calcium based shell that is being that are being eroded by the increased uh, acidity of seawater. And, um, and that's because, right, because the added carbon, because the, the ocean is acting as a sink, it's, it's absorbing more carbon because there's more carbon in the atmosphere. Yep. Um, no, it's, it's, a really, it's a really cool example. Well, not, cool might not be the right descriptor, but it's a really poignant example because we teach a chapter on solubility and acid-based chemistry and all these equilibria. And this is just a quintessential example of where acidity coincides with solubility and calcium carbonate, when you add acid, dissolves. And so you do this with eggshells. If you want to coat a Easter egg with more color, you soak it in acetic acid first, like that standard procedure. This is happening to seashells on the ocean floor. And we get to talk about this in Gen Chem, which is really fun. And it's really a basic, like, introductory general chemistry problem. Chemistry right? concept, but then... Global impact. Well, and has a real... And, and, and it's not just an abstraction, like, okay, I need to know this for the test. It's more like, no, you need to know this as a as a citizen of the planet um, who's uh, who's uh, you know trying to understand what's going on i really try i'm excited about that i'm glad you're doing it be, and helping connect these dots because uh you know getting past just that you know i think that that getting past the the co2 focus or the warming focus and then mm -hmm. and then the question well we had a cooler winter you know it was cool last week are you sure it's still warming or you know all the, yeah. the things about that you know it's yeah, yeah, yeah. We're bringing a snowball to congress yeah right. i get it <laughs> cuddle puppy antarctican cruises are going to have a boom when the coral reefs can only survive in the antarctic <laughs> That's that's an optimistic way to look at it. Somebody will gain something. That's how capitalism works. <laughs> All right, what about a little centipede? Can we uh, let me move over? Centipede, yes. Let me look up some centipede. Is that, is it, or, uh... No, it, it, it'll be easy to find. Okay. All right, but in the meantime, we're going to put up another prediction. This is going to be one about Andy on a personal level. We're going to say, what did you guys learn about his Quake and his Galaga gameplay that'll help you answer this question about his personal life? He is a deadhead. <laughs> it's fair to call you a deadhead. Yes, right. <laughs> How many Grateful Dead shows has Andy seen in his lifetime? Greater than 100 or less than 100? And, uh, and of the, course, but bet bet all of your coins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's your <laughs> Because it's, it's, there's inflation happening, so uh, <laughs> yeah, these, use these them all. Standard internet units are important. Uh, what do you spell centipede? Sen centipede. I gotta search for it. Centipede. Cent. Centipede. It should be cent. go back i know this is available for the nes so i'm going to find it if you don't uh, mind playing uh, one more yeah yeah yeah. that's fine uh, can i um refresh my yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely okay um so there's oh, oh, yeah. the Nevada. Yeah, work. all right thank you sorry i should have been a more gracious host <laughs> on this <laughs> it's, it's distracting we have many things going on centipede is a, it's an nes game i literally have it on the shelf back there there we go. Oh man, we have it for many systems. Alright, you guys have about 15 seconds left. How many Grateful Dead shows has Andy seen? What is your guest? <laughs> Google is not going to help you. <laughs> no. Feel free to cheat all you wish. <laughs> I do like the personal questions for this reason. Oh, do I not have Centipede for the NES? 
Well, we could do... What's another one that's in that genre? Um... No, I'm astound astounded by this. So I literally have the carpet cartridge back there. Oh, Oh, it's called oh. Millipede on the NES. Oh, that is my mistake. Okay. okay, it was Centipede on the arcade. It's Millipede on the NES. All right. Oh, uh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I'll get that guy out of the way. So I don't know, Andy, if you want to recount our... We were going to try Oculus. Yeah, oh, right, right. We were going to try Oculus. And um, for whatever reason, the Apple MacBook Pro silicone... The latest was not being um, not being happy with uh, the, the system here, so so we couldn't get it to output. But um, but I do want to say there are some there are some really interesting games and experiences on um, on the Oculus. So for those of you that are considering um, VR a VR headset, or if you uh, are interested in VR and you want to take a class uh, where we do some VR production, um, come talk to me because we're um, uh, every semester I teach something, uh, either I've been teaching uh, 360 video production, uh, I've been teaching uh, a, a, an introduction to um, to Unity and, and what I've been calling immersive documentary. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I'm uh, intrigued. I'm going to figure out why it didn't work, so next time you're on we'll be able to do it, but yeah. <laughs> We were, we were debating if we can play, you know, do we have enough room to stand? Can we do Oculus? So no, it's no longer Oculus right now. It's owned by Meta. Meta. I don't, Meta I'm a, it's it. going to be Oculus as far as I'm concerned. It's <laughs> always going to be Oculus. Oh, man. Between that and Twitter, it's just, it's all downhill. Because, <laughs> uh. uh, um, so, and the, and the game that I wanted to show people was a game called Puzzling Places, which is really... Um, really amazing in that they they take these high-res scans using photogrammetry and um i don't know how to play this game uh, <laughs> uh, and then um uh um and then then they they break the three-dimensional scans apart into pieces and um Awesome. And you put them together, and you can choose from anywhere from 25 to 400 pieces uh, with each. And they they choose really interesting subject matter to um. Oh, I didn't realize I can go up to. Uh, 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 yeah, I think the gray space you can yeah, occupy the gray space, any of that. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, don't let the spider get you. Um, so anyway, puzzling places is really cool. And um, and, and I was just watching a, a a development video by the group, and there's only five of them on their development team. Uh, but it's um, anyway, it's a it's a great great use of the technology, I think. Um, uh, and then and then for more social issue stuff, traveling while black is amazing. Uh, we live here is a great piece about um, that helps us understand the struggles of homelessness. Um, uh, the Anne Frank house is really pretty interesting. Huh. Uh, you know. The, I mean, so let, let, let's dive down that rabbit hole because now you're you're diving into this world of the using VR for video production. Like, what does it what does that look like? How does that contrast with normal video production? Well, well, right. So, okay, so um, there are 360 cameras, mm -hmm. uh, which um, uh, we 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 have arranged them and um in our in the media production program in the school of communication and uh, everything from. Uh, you know, maybe a six or seven hundred dollar GoPro Max, which is just two D, meaning um, you know, like like traditional television, except it's, it wraps all around you. But then we have, but then there's stereo, three D, uh, three sixty, and and in those cameras we have everything from the Insta Pro, uh, Insta Pro Two, which is maybe like a, you know, maybe like an eight or ten thousand dollar camera. I think, I think it's like. I think it's 6K, but then we also, we recently acquired a, a, a version of the Instapro Titan, which is an 11K tight uh, camera where each, it's it's got eight lenses and each lens has a micro four thirds sensor. So it's very good in low light 
and um, and it's a really high resolution uh, 360 camera. So really, um, you know, really amazing technology that um, that brings viewers into a space, and the space becomes becomes a character. Mm -hmm. It becomes one of the central parts of uh, of the film because it's a, so it's instead of you don't ever get a close up of anybody instead um instead you get um uh, you're brought into a space and and then in that space um uh you know different things happen mm -hmm. um and so this changes the dynamic it changes how you make these films how you produce them absolutely it's, it's, right all so the traditional lighting and framing your rule of thirds for comp composing shots goes out the window yeah you're not composing a shot anymore you're uh yeah. I mean, so that's interesting. So all the rules about framing and positional things, so like you have to really rely on amplifying what people should be looking at and how, how you do that. Exactly. And you use sound cues um, to, to direct attention or lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might be a part of a, of a scene that you really don't want people looking at at all. You just try and keep it dark. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's... Uh, Man, but even if you try all those things, people get to experience this however they want. So really, it opens up the experience more beyond your control. Yeah, is that, exactly. Is that a good or a bad thing? No, well, <laughs> I, I think for the most part, it's a good thing because, uh, in, you know, like people, there are narrative examples of it. But I, I, we focus on documentary production in our program, in the in the production program in the School of Communication, because mm -hmm. the film school does an outstanding job mm -hmm. with narrative uh the narrative tradition so we we're trying to stake out more of a documentary reality-based filmmaking tradition mm -hmm. in the school of communication and so uh applying these tools these vr 360 tools to um to reality-based things and and bringing so i was able to do a fulbright in norway um and uh and was able to take one of these cameras up on the yostadal glacier which is the largest glacier in um <laughs> you can help me out here. Yes. <laughs> it takes all the pressure off. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> all right. So, so let's, let's let's finish our prediction. How many Grateful Dead shows has Andy seen? We have a 50-50 split on greater than 100, less than 100. What is your true answer? The true answer is less than 100. No, uh, much to my chagrin. I would say closer closer to 75. Um, uh, Depending on how you, if you count Garcia band or uh, the, <laughs> the offshoots, yeah, yeah, you know, Garcia and, uh, and and John Kahn acoustic at the Orpheum in Boston, and, man, yeah. that's fun. And I was also, uh, you know, as part of when I when I traveled to um, to Nigeria for my undergraduate honors work, I I managed to get a really high end audio recorder for that project. So then I I was kind of a, you know part of the taping community at various points or, oh that's fun you know had some had some fun with that um and that's a really uh really robust uh group of people and 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 just an incredible business model right that i think you know has been now replicated by lots of groups over uh over the years um but but that idea of giving away your 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 live recordings um and knowing that that the the live recording is the the live show is where it's at because every show is different mm -hmm. um and so there's a lot of bands that have picked up that church a lot of festivals um jj thank you for stopping by it's been a pleasure uh thank you for joining us and doing the predictions and learning about documentary films and yeah, swing back in a couple of weeks, we'll actually have Josh Melko from University of North Florida, who spent a year as a congressional advisor in Washington, D.C. He's wow. a chemist that actually advised uh, Congress people. So, yeah, a couple of weeks. It'll be a Thursday night two weeks from now. So join us again. Um, but, yeah, uh, Reese's Pieces has redeemed Take a Drink. So, Andy, cheers. Thank you for joining cheers. us, Reese's Pieces. Hopefully you have something in hand. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you guys. We are drinking High Lie Mixed Pack tonight. A whole bunch of different versions. There's a white oak version of this as well, which I haven't tried yet. Oh, nice. But Reese's Pieces, thank you as always for joining us and making us drink. We really appreciate it. We have fun with it. <laughs> but that's fun. 360 filmmaking. Somebody should request a factoid because I have a Grateful Dead factoid that's kind of fun. This is something you're probably well aware of, but something I learned about in high school. 
Actually, I can request my own factoid. Well, and, if, and for any Grateful Dead fans out there, if you haven't listened to the good old Grateful Dead cast, which is a podcast put out by the Grateful Dead uh, organization, you know, in their in the post Dead era, um, it's just an unbelievable uh, archive um, and and podcast that they put together. It really, uh, they do a fantastic job, so I can't, you know, highly recommend that. So I want to see if Andy, this is trivia for you. Maybe okay. you know this or not. Okay. Ni 1996 Olympics, Grateful Dead sponsoring a basketball team. Are you aware of this? Uh, no, 96, because that's post Garcia's death. Yep. So, but they sponsored a basketball team. So the Lithuanian basketball team didn't have enough money to travel to the Olympics. And so the Grateful Dead actually sponsored them. And there's a really awesome jersey from the Lithuania uh, basketball. I'll look this up for you. But they, they, yeah, the reason they got to compete in the Olympics, and they took bronze from that. But what's awesome is, and you'll recognize this immediately, that was the the shirts that oh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's uh -huh. Grateful Dead it's dunking basketball skeletons it is absolutely amazing very nice but very yeah nice. so the way Lithuania basketball team got to the Olympics is sponsorship by the Grateful Dead yeah yep. well I, I had a tie-dye business for a while <laughs> I, I did I sold a lot of shirts uh, you know I, popular style oh yeah oh yeah no and um that was that was like 80 87 88 you know uh yeah no, I had a uh, I had a shirt from that from the Lithuania basketball team, and it was one of my favorites for about a decade, actually. So, yeah, that's a factoid near and dear to my heart. In this game. Yeah. All right, what, 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 what else? We <laughs> maybe we should try a little. Uh, uh, I don't know. We just go go classic Pac-Man. Uh... Pac-Man. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they, they're so unforgiving. That's for sure. <laughs> Pac-Man, Pac-Man or Mrs. Pac-Man? Ah, uh, either. There we go. Found a Pac-Man for you. All right. All right. Pac-Man. We're trying it again. All right, but now, but now that one cheese still active. But... <laughs> It's no, like, I have to oh. find a new one. It's for each oh, one. I don't okay, know if you okay, okay, okay. but yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm here fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, anyone just joining us, Ask a Scientist Gaming, Mediocre Gameplay, Expert Science. Our guest today is Dr. Andy Opel. Dr. Opel is an expert in documentary filmmaking theory, history. He's happy to answer any questions you may have. He's also dabbling with VR filmmaking, which is a pretty interesting topic. Uh, Dr. Opal, uh, are you familiar with William Maxgill and or Effective Autism Movement? No. I do not know who that is, but I will look it up very quickly. Altruism. Sorry, I looked I saw autism. It's altruism. <laughs> oh, oh, cuddle puppy. I apologize. I'm a couple beers in. William uh, Maxgill. Altruism. Oh, interesting. Altruism. Yeah. Scottish philosopher and ethicist, effective altruism movement, associate professor at Oxford, University of Oxford. Giving what we can center effective altruism in 80,000 hours. Here is a link for anyone that's interested. Nice. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll have the link. You'll have the YouTube video to recount some of these because posting all these links as I can go. Oh, cuddle puppy, I apologize. <laughs> There's a big difference between autism and altruism. Um. So yeah, the guy, the, the, the documentary I mentioned, uh, King of Kong, Fistful of Quarters, the, the bad guy in it was the first person that was recorded to have a perfect Pac-Man game. Uh. So he did all, whatever, 128 levels uh, or something, sure. getting every single... But... Then he turned into a villain. So it's, it's it's pretty amazing storytelling. It really is a lot of fun. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy though uh, to to take a career like that and tank it. Um, that's what power, I'm, even I'm, video game power, corrupts absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's the crazy thing though. Like, and Bill Burr has an awesome diatribe about this. Like, uh, especially with like you know Lance Armstrong like, uh, and doping yeah, himself to yeah, win, and yeah, it's like yeah. 
His, his diatribe is basically, we were lucky that that's what he chose to exert his <laughs> focus on. Like, when you're willing to do anything, we're lucky he's not CEO of a company right. dumping shit in the water. Instead, right. he wants to bike fast. Right. Like, we got off easy. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and it's a good critique. Like, pick your goals. <laughs> Just don't damage other people. But yeah. Autistic people are often altruistic, though. <laughs> it all, it's all tying together. <laughs> oh, man, I like it. All right, so one of the one of the questions we ask all our guests, well, we have a couple standard questions, like, well, what's a... One we ask the scientist in particular is, what movie or TV show gets your discipline right and wrong? That's uh -huh. not really fair for your domain of research, because it is related to production and things like that. But the other one we like to do is, if you had unlimited budget and no moral qualms, what would you do with it? Like, for us, it would be experiments of a certain kind. For you, you could produce or study or do anything you wanted with unlimited budget. What would you do? Um, yeah, uh, hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, I think I would uh, I would make some giant puppets. And, um, <laughs> a good start. <laughs> a good start. Go anywhere. <laughs> and, and then, well, you know, there's this there's this troupe uh, that does. Um, I'm going to need to change games. This this game is uh, driving me crazy. Part of it is the controller. I think I, I'm going to blame it on the controller. <laughs> yes, it's not a joystick. I do apologize. No, 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 no it's fine. But it's just. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, there's this group out of Nantes, France, that um, that does these giant puppet um, installations, and uh, oh, you're talking about the 30 foot like walking robotic. Yeah, thing. well, yeah. And, and they're but they're kind of manned by um, uh, by teams of people, mm -hmm. and and I was in London when they did the Sultan's Elephant came, and yeah. it was just unbelievable. A live band being towed behind this giant elephant, and then and the girl who comes and. Um, anyway, I think, um, I, and, and I've done, my wife and I have been involved with, uh, these community festivals where we, we make giant puppets and, um, and do kind of, uh, little rock operas with them and things. And so, um, it'd be nice to have, have some resources and, uh, you know, fe festivals, uh, festivals with puppets. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you create. Given, given, uh, given a, uh, a little, what are you gonna do with your with your lottery winnings? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a festival. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, and then, other than that, um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's a hard question. It is a hard question because uh, you know I don't know that any particular media is really gonna do what we need it to do. You know, um, you can have you can have the best media in the world and and still. Uh, not you know we're not gonna we're not gonna it's not gonna get where we need to go with the climate issue so um yeah i mean so yours is a very realistic answer like you, you could have said like i want to terraform the moon and document it and <laughs> make a movie about it like <laughs> the sky's the limit if your budget is truly unlimited <laughs> true. Like, true. you can go far like how far do you want to go <laughs> <laughs> you can blow up the moon. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Oh, <laughs> uh, I like it. Yeah, Scott Stagg's answer was actually he wanted... To, I mean, we get a lot of, like, really exotic experiments and things, but Scott Stagg was like, I want to start a religion with Carl Sagan as the deity. Uh, <laughs> and he wants to see what the implications of that. Like, uh, that, turn science into a religion. Does it, does it have far-reaching impacts if you do it through that mechanism? But, but science brings us back almost a mono monocausal mm -hmm. paxophilia question where you know like one 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 belief solves everything and and and, and so I'm always a little suspicious of yeah that. yeah um, no, it makes sense. I mean, that's the advantage science has is it's not an answer. It's a, it's a process. Right, it's a process. Processes can yeah. change. Yeah, and that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, so the religion, and, and religion has a process, right, which then is more like Buddhism, really. You know, it's like, it's a practice. Yep. And, um, and, and I guess, I guess is, is considered a practice, but uh, sometimes people, I think, feel, you know, hold to it so strongly that, 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 that their practice is the only practice. I think I'm going to need a different game. Yeah. What do you want to do? Um, now, well, we mentioned Defender. Do you have Defender? Do I have <laughs> Defender? 
Or, uh, or should we go, um... I think I have Defender. I know I have Defender 2 for sure for the Nintendo. Defender 2 is probably pretty close to what you're used to. Let's try some Defender 2. And again, we can do cheat codes. In fact, there's one active. Let's try it. <laughs> See what it does. Oh, this is such a throwback. I can't... Oh, so let me see. Oh, I gotta press start. And, uh, yeah. and I think you can go forward and backwards. Yeah, yeah, right? up and yeah. down, right? Yep, and, and, yep. And, and, and there we go. Okay. But, but, I forget what you do. Uh, uh, you shoot these guys, right? And, oh, and you gotta save when they're picking up stuff. Yep, the people. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Oh. I don't remember who played oh, yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, so, you Somebody was playing this. this. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, now I'm remembering. This is a long time ago. So this is 80, 80, 80, early 80s. I graduated high school in 82, so this had to be like 1980 when I was playing. So what is that? It's, it's a long time ago. <laughs> 82 was almost exactly 40 uh, years ago. Yeah. I know that because I was born in 82. I just turned <laughs> You were born in 82. <laughs> I was born in 82. <laughs> I'm the eldest of the millennials, actually. So, so I... I, 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 I get it. Oh. He died. Oh, you're the oldest of the millennials, and I'm kind of, I think I'm technically the oldest of the boomers. Oh, what? So, okay, really? I know, I know. I, I, oh. I, I do my best to hide my boomer. <laughs> <laughs> my boomerness. Uh, uh, it, yeah. it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, boomer. <laughs> Old man waves Old man. at the yeah, cloud, exactly. yes. <laughs> Get out of the way. Uh, yeah, you've had your you've done your share of destroying everything good. Alright, so while we dive into Defender, I mean you have you, you you're uniquely positioned because you obviously teach this content, but you have projects actively in the works. I yeah. mean you're writing music, all sorts of things. Like what what project are you most excited about right now? What is what is your What's driving you right now? Uh, well, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying uh, I'm trying to learn a bunch of technology, and um, and and then and and oh and so one of the way one of the t pieces of technology I'm trying to learn is called um, is laser scanning of, of spaces interior spaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then you can from that laser scan it creates a point cloud and then you can uh, develop that into a a 3D space, a very realistic, you know, capture. Oh, a 3D space uh, that then you can bring into a to a game engine. And so I'm so, working with the people at Goodwood, yeah. uh, the Goodwood Museum and Gardens, um, here in Tallahassee, which is a very well preserved southern plantation with a very dark history uh, that has been uh, well, literally whitewashed um, uh, in the past. But they're new. They've got a, a more recent director who's really interested in um, uh, in uncovering the real history of Goodwood, and and so um, so I'm trying to put together some grant proposals to raise some money where we can scan the grounds and the buildings, and then and then begin to make get past the surfaces. Use because right now the surfaces of good like the buildings and the antiques create like. Oh, look at this pretty old southern space, mm -hmm. right? But they 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 hide the incredible oh, uh, brutality of the enslaved that the whole place was literally built by. Mm -hmm. So I think in order to bring that history back and make it visible, you know, we need some of these more contemporary tools. At least this is my thinking. So yeah. So by if you can create a virtual a digital twin, it's called of. Uh, of Goodwood, and then begin to make the uh, um, various objects more interactable, mm -hmm. um, so you can uh, you can understand the object, the history of the objects, as well as the history of the people who live there. And mm. and uh, so there's multiple phases to my project. I'm trying to the goal is to initially create the digital twin of the space, then add the interactables, which gets at the history of the. The, pl the place and the objects, and then the third phase will be uh, characters that will be cast, and and um, and there will be uh, you'll be able to have some interactions then with these characters uh, as a as. 
So the digital mapping technology, if I'm not mistaken, that's really popular in like realty right now, like it's online been, well, exactly, tourism and exactly, stuff like that. Exactly, exactly, and 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 it, it's super popular. And and Matterport is one of the companies that is doing this. Um, but they're and so they're very proprietary, and it's and it's got a. Uh, I see. I see. It's got it's got a one dimensional use, right? Which is real estate, and and so you sell can't, a house, you, <laughs> yeah. and, and 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 not to then create an, an interactive environment that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, oh, um, so I think um, you know we we managed to get the, this Leica, uh, very very high end scanning camera mm -hmm. through a, um, a a tech fee grant, and uh, from the university and and then there's some software now to, you know, again everything's a lot more complicated than you think. So, um, so I try and balance, you know, it's like having to get way in the weeds on this stuff. Yeah. And then, but but also wanting to, um, oh. Uh, <laughs> Mutilating. <laughs> um, you know, but wanting to get the tools in the hands of students so then they can do cool things and, 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 and begin to, um, you know, experiment with it. Because students always, you know, and often have very good ideas and... Yeah, that's really fun. And and so um, yeah, it, it, you know, ta taking getting getting a hold of these tools, learning how to use them, getting them in students' hands. That's that's what's energizing me right now. And and I and it's funny because I'm not a I'm I'm not like a VR uh, proselytizer. Like I, I I'm kind of agnostic about it because mm -hmm. I think part of me as a, like my environmental sides is like why do I want to put that headset on when I could go <laughs> outside? You know. Um, but I, but but when I do put it on, I, I feel like it, there's a, it's a very powerful medium, um, in the same way that film and television are very powerful mediums, right? And have they can be used for banal entertainment or just gratuitous violence, or they can be used to really help enlighten and develop empathy and, and understanding for for more complex uh, situations. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm. And, and I think it, these tools need universities uh, getting them in the hands of both faculty and students and creating projects to, to figure out what they're good for. Because if they're only left to the corporate sector and the entertainment industry, uh, like we will all will have our first person shooters, mm -hmm. you know, or, or predominantly, you know, like, uh, um, you know, be dominated by first person shooters. And, I, and there's a lot more to these technologies than, than first person shooters. So. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we just crossed 10 o'clock. Everyone, welcome to Ask a Scientist Gaming, mediocre gameplay expert science guest today is Dr. Andy Opel. He's an expert in documentary filmmaking and um, in theory and history and can tell you pretty much everything about documentaries. Also exploring VR for new submersive documentary type scenarios. Um, but also we're gonna do a quick prediction because it is time. So if you're not following us, click the follow button, get your 300 standard internet units. We're gonna do a prediction. In our case, we're doing questions related to the expertise of our guest. Uh, in fact, they come up with all the questions. And so here is a fun question. The first stereoscopic images, that is the first 3D images that anyone ever generated, people seeing imagery that was three-dimensional, was it before 1850 or after 1850? When did this happen? When did we create first stereoscopic images? Before 1850 or after 1850? Note you're on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code. You cannot look up the answer. Do your guesses accordingly because it's kind of fun to do so. Oh, did I miss a factoid? Reese's Pieces, did you request a factoid and we did not redeem that? If so, we owe you a factoid. But yeah, if you guys are, are, are not following, click follow, use your standard internet units. Gamble, when did the first stereoscopic 3D images exist? And so now we're making 3D maps of entire spaces and selling you realty, but maybe making, you know, informational videos regarding slavery and plantations. Um... But yeah, stereoscopic images had to start somewhere. When did they start? Before 1850 or after 1850? Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's been really interesting to work. And so well, I got started. Oh, I didn't know you that crashed you. Um, I didn't, you know, I started working in uh, stereoscopic media uh, the year Avatar came out. <laughs> um, and so, so FSU was one of the first schools to get uh, uh, what was called the Panasonic 3D A1, which is the first video camera which had two lenses, but was a single-body camera. So historically, 
all 3D films were made with two cameras side by side. Huh. And but the single the, the by putting it into a single point and shoot camera, ooh, um, it it revolutionized the production of of 3D media mm -hmm. and made it uh, much much easier because uh, the the camera stayed in alignment. You could uh, adjust your convergence points much easier, much more easily. Um, so so starting in 2009, then uh, I've been working in this in this area and trying to oh coming from behind um you know trying to understand and uh, you know what's what's useful and and how is it uh, where where is stereo media helpful what is it what does it do for us um mm -hmm. what are what are good applications of it and um, so for for a while you know i just we taught 3D production, just 3D media production, uh, and and in the process, I went had to go back and learn the history, which this factoid is going to reveal, and uh, among other things. And um, uh, but then there was a point where you know, so it, it was starting to go out of fashion again, and and I was like, okay, man, it's time to give this up, and, and it's just over. <laughs> but right at that same moment is when. Google Cardboard came out, which was the first kind of consumer level um, VR that was powered by your phone. Mm -hmm. And you put your phone in this little cardboard device and suddenly you had stereoscopic media that was 360. So it was both. So uh, so it combined 360 video and, um, uh, and uh, stereoscopic, you know, uh, oh, media so so then that that i said okay well i will stay with 3d then and we will we will go to um uh into vr and that's that's what led me into vr and um and and, and the vr production process all right so the question is closed first stereoscopic 3d images before 1850 after 1850 andy what is your answer my answer is before 1850. Um, Which is crazy when you think about that timeline. <laughs> I know. Well, and um, it was 1838 um, and uh, the, the, the first stereoscopic images. And right, so it was almost figured out at the exact same time as the advent of photography itself. So, which is really fascinating because um, then we ended up with uh, a whole a, a whole media industry based around around 3D images, and that that industry then um, was really kind of the first uh, first 3D tech bubble, if you will. <laughs> that is the cool new thing. It was the Atari of, it, it, and it really was. And, and, and they um, so stereoscopes, uh, which are, which were the little holders. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, invented the one of the most popular stereoscopes, which is which is made of wood, and it just held a little card in front of you, and you would hold it and look through. And these were um, incredibly popular, so much so that they um, they sold a million by by the 1850s. They were selling a million a year in London, um, and uh, Queen Victoria was given given a stereoscope, and uh, the 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 gentleman who um, who uh, is it Charles Wheatstone? No, who's the um, who's the the, the mayor? Who? Oh, oh, maybe maybe we can put that, that up there. Um, might not have. Yeah. Um, so the the one of the guys who was the first um, kind of uh, stereoscope um, tycoons, if you will. Uh, um, later, when he took the fortune that he made selling stereograms, and stereograms are the name for the two two image cards that that were very popular starting in the 1840s up through about 1880, and and those stereograms, and um, and then they they the, the thing transitioned and became uh, in the first part of the 20th century became the um, the viewmaster, but. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, but that that first uh, stereogram tycoon um, became the mayor of London based on his fortune um, that he made selling stereograms. So it was one of these early uh, where you know the tech industry was merging with politics, and so he was the Elon Musk of his time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, in the 1800s, so it's really it's it's really fascinating. And then what happened was um, a series of boom and busts. Uh, where um, 3D 
became popular and then it became it was a fad and then it went away and then it was a fad again and then it went away and and you know they were um there were movies and they tried to add smell and they and then they and they try and they use the anaglyph the red and the blue glasses and then they used the the stereo the polarizing lenses um and and um and so all the the various techniques to try and um revive it at each iteration and and then avatar in 2009 was the biggest 3d wave which then launched you know for about another about another six or eight years um you had a real you know you had the lord of the rings um, which was shot at, at 60 hertz and um, 60 frames and, and really, um, uh, again, a, a kind of a, a, had a lot of people paying extra in the theater for their 3D glasses and things. Um, and there were even home televisions for, for a while that, that were 3D monitors, but they realized people didn't like to wear the glasses in their house. So, so 3D then went away. And by, by 2008, 17, 18, you know, it was over. Like you couldn't buy a, a, a 3D TV in Costco, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, uh, but now with VR, you got to wear a headset for VR. So it's a natural fit. If you're going to wear a headset, you might as well view it in stereo. And, um, and and the stereo media that's created in in um, in for the Oculus and and for other other you know PSVR and uh, is 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 really awesome you know it's really it's really it's part of what makes it so great so um, so for for those of you not familiar the 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 way your brain generates 3D images is you're you're essentially tricking your eyes right you're doing similar to what you do parallax to figure out the distance of a star from a point you'd have two cameras and you can figure out the distance from that but a brain is basically tricked into looking at two different images but interpreting it as the same image and you can control the distance based on the overlap between those and so that the the first invention was really cool cuz you just took two different lenses and different images and like it's 3D. It has comes out at you different distances, and then what was it? It was like the red blue 3D glasses, yep, like and having yep. two different colors, and then uh, plain polarized. That yep. was the the the. And that was the a real innovation because that brought nice color saturation yeah. back. It still lowered the the brightness of the screen because the polarization cut down the light level. So yeah, uh, so it, 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 it you know it still had an impact on the the, the feel of the film. Man, I went to Avatar when I was in grad school, and I was in grad school at the University of Southern California, so I was in L.A., so I went to the, like, really nice theater that had, like, the glass lenses and plain polarized, and I went there with a friend, and afterwards he was like, that was the most information-dense movie ever produced in history, right? Because it's not just, you know, what's on the screen, it's three-dimensional data as well, which is absolutely breathtaking. But here, but here's one for you, Andy. I don't know if you're familiar with circularly polarized light. Have you heard of this? <laughs> So vertical and horizontal polarized light, like that's how your cell phone works. That's how LCD screens work. And so if you have polarized sunglasses and you look at LCD screen and you tilt your head, it goes from black to like transparent. Yeah. Circularly polarized light is something entirely different. So you can have a left-handed and a right-handed circularly polarized. Exactly. And yeah. so if you can get contact lenses with left and right circularly polarized, theoretically you could have 3D vision, 3D advertisements, 3D everything in your casual day-to-day -day life. And that would be the pinnacle, presumably, of 3D technology. And that and that and that circular polarization, actually that's what um Real D, which created those glasses for, for cinemas and, and then later for your home televisions, uh, that's what they went to because what people that's were doing is they were lying on the couch. Yeah. And the vertical <laughs> the vertical was then uh, you know, it was messed because so they would do vertical and horizontal, and one would block out because there's two images that are pe being projected on the screen at the same time. You were and we and our brains resolve it to one image, mm -hmm. um, uh, but 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 the uh, <laughs> but how you separate out those two images, yeah, is um, is has been the the big uh technical problem for filmmakers when you're doing it in a group. Like it's easy when it's just an individual because like with an eye with a headset on, your your eye one one eye is seeing the the right image and one eye is seeing the left image. So 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 you um it's it's separated mechanically. Mm -hmm. But um but when it's projected on a screen the the the, the two images have to be separated by filters. Mm -hmm. Huggy Bear, welcome back to the stream. I had a 3D TV neat while there were three channels. Oh, that's interesting. I thought I heard there were glassless 3D monitors being worked on. Yes, there are. How and we have work? one in the School of Communication. It's 
It's it's not great, but um, yes, there there are. It's uh, they use a lenticular. Um, so uh, I don't know if you ever saw like they used to sometimes put them on cereal boxes back in the old days, like a kind of three D uh, pictures, and that that uses uh, it's plastic um, with then. Uh, a bevel, a beveled screen where it, it is able to send the light from one image more to the left eye and, and the light from the other image to oh, more to the right that eye. that is intriguing. Yeah. Okay, so you're spatially resolving the incident light yeah. rather than filtering it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And you have a screen that does that. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I might want to swing by sometime just to see that because yeah. that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and it was uh, actually made here in Florida. I mean, you you have to be staring directly at the screen and perfectly in, spanner. Right, and the, yeah. and, <laughs> and then the 3D has to be done in a certain way because mm -hmm. um, there's you know there's positive and negative parallax, which means where your yeah. eyes converge, they yeah. converge at screen plane, or, or negative parallax is in front of screen plane and positive <laughs> is behind it, and um, uh, uh, um, so you um. And you can control that in production. You can control where that convergence point is. Um, <laughs> that that's incredible. I, I did not know about that technology. I'm excited. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. One of the things I really liked about the, the the 3D TVs, it has nothing to do with 3D, but you could theoretically do two people watching the same screen, but watching independent things. One's vertical, one's horizontal. So video gaming, obviously, you can't filter out screen watching because you can only see one of the two screens which I, I thought was really clever but they stopped selling 3d screens right they that did is, that pretty is... much i mean i think you maybe find it on, oh find it on ebay or something but but uh no they stopped making them well and that was right at the same time that 4k they stopped at the same time because they realized okay people will pay the extra for 4k mm -hmm. and, and there's way more 4k content yeah you know, the, um whereas uh I mean, that was probably the problem. The content, like what people made, like Spy Kids 3D was just garbage, like 3D for the sake of 3D and not Avatar-like storytelling. Right. Like, oh. and that just, that's tragic. Yeah. I mean, but we see that with new technologies every time. Like, do they hit? Do they have enough content available? No, that's intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Circularly polarized contact lenses. <laughs> Do you want advertising augmented reality in your actual life? That that's what's coming. Uh, <laughs> it's meta. I mean, so 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 VR is going through you know a bit of a renaissance, but also things like the metaverse are are hindering that presumably to some degree. The cost of three D virtual equipment. I mean, do you see see it still on the up and up, or is it? Um, downtrend well, where, where are we on uh, this is a good question uh, you know the question is will right will we will it suffer the same kind of um, boom and bust trajectory that the last 150 years of stereoscopic <laughs> media has, has given us or is almost this 200 one gonna years, work uh, 1838 you know so whatever almost 200 years of yeah. boom and bust and um, I think there's more staying power this time to the um, to the VR yeah. uh, technology. I I personally the um, social VR is really interesting, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's um, you know where where people are meeting. What I think most people think of as the metaverse. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, and and there's a film called uh, We Met in Virtual Reality. On uh, and I believe it is on HBO Max, and it is really great. It was all filmed inside VR chat, and it um, uh, it really shows a, a very uh, a, a very human side to what goes on inside inside these spaces. Um, that that it, that it helps get past the stereotype of either the you know. The old guy trying to pretend he's a young, attractive person, or, or, um, you know, kind of the the more purient um, uh, stereotypes, I think. Yeah. Uh, and and instead shows a real humanity that people are connecting in ways that that a lot of people um, don't predict, haven't predicted, and and didn't anticipate. So, I've you know, and I've I've been really. Uh, had some really great experiences in, in social VR, uh, going to um, virtual Burning Man. Um, <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> yeah, because there were two years when Burning Man didn't happen in person because yeah. of the pandemic. 
and um, and and so all that creative energy and, and resources went into um, creating uh, virtual Burning Man, and and it was ten days only, and it was free, and and so oh, I keep getting my own guys. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. They deserve uh, it. <laughs> what are they doing? Yeah. Like yeah. Cars? Anyway. Hey, come on. Anyway, <laughs> they should be taking Musk <laughs> to economy class to Mars. You know, it's like... <laughs> I like it. I mean, so, so like Facebook's metaverse is clearly a bust. Like they've lost billions of dollars. But Apple recently announced uh, virtual reality. They're going after headset. Like that has to be promising. Well, right? and I don't, I, I don't think you can say that they're that, that Facebook's is a bust because um, because Facebook is is behind Oculus and Oculus the the wireless the self contained wireless headset mm -hmm. is has been has has been the thing that I think has, yeah, yeah. Has, has gotten a lot of people in into the game and 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 shown people what the possibilities are um so i think their their horizons world um uh is uh, isn't that popular mm -hmm. right at the moment but yeah. um, but i think there's it, it still is a little bit hard to know um you know because there's different platforms so there's alt space and there's vr chat and then there's facebook horizons and and all of these have really complex, diverse place things going on in them mm -hmm. um, that people have built that are user generated and and, and built. So, um, uh, I mean, well, one of the limitations is the technological restriction, like what they let you do with it, right? So, like when Facebook took over Oculus, they they got rid of a lot of developer tools and things like they could extend the use of them and. Or am I getting that wrong? I might, I might be getting that yeah. wrong. But even like Apple, it's going to be very proprietary on what they let you do with that technology. And that usually hinders development, right? If you don't have flexibility to do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. But, well, I don't know. I mean, there's, right, because the Oculus Store is a gatekeeper in the same way that the Apple Store is. Yeah. And, and Google Play. To Google Play tends to be a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there are lots of other places that you can access um, content and 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 load it onto your onto your device, mm -hmm. um, and and that are that are user generated games and experiences and, and mm -hmm. um, so uh, again I think I think it's evolving because in the way that YouTube YouTube blew open the doors for for video content creators yeah um, and 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 took took the took it out of the hands of the broadcasters. Um, Man, Reese's, oh. Reese's Pieces, I, I still don't think we gave you your factoid. Right. It's been 37 minutes. Andy, drop a factoid. I'm going to run to the restroom. Okay. We'll be right Let's, back. I'm going to pause here. I'm gonna, yeah. Let, let me see. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. So the, the, the factoid here is, um, and we're going back to a climate issue. Uh, well, let, let me see if I get, can look at something. Uh, oh, I'm going to use this. Oh. Um, oh, this is good. Um, so the, the, the annual weight of plastic production across the globe is equivalent to the entire, to the weight of the entire human population. Um, uh, and that, so that is a true fact that every year, well, I'm not, not the history of the production of plastic, but every year. We are producing nearly 400 million tons of plastic. And remember, a ton is 2,000 pounds. Um, so 400 million tons of plastic waste, uh, which is equivalent to the weight of the entire human population, according to the UN, um, the United Nations Environment Program. Um, then, um, and it rose, so the, the plastic waste generated in the early 2000s rose more in a single decade than it had in the prior four years. Um, and across the globe, one million plastic bottles are purchased every single minute, minute and a half of all plastic produced, and 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 half of all the plastic that is produced is designed for single use purposes. So, um, and uh, their their plastic is described as a forever chemical because it's it's got a very very long decomposition um, timeline. 
and it is now showing up. It's showing up in organisms in the Marianas Trench. It's showing up in, it's passing the blood-brain barrier. It's showing up in breast milk. It's, it's showing up in infants' bloodstreams. Um, you know, we have, we have permeated the planet with this substance. And, uh, and, and it is just, and, and with, 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 no, with no regard for its, um, for its long-term, long or short-term impacts. So, you know, it's really astounding um, that that's why we can we call this the Anthropocene, right? The, the, which is a geologic term, the geologic age. But we are marking, you know, um, geologists in the future will be able to find this layer of plastic in the geologic record. And, and uh, you know, among the other changes that we're, we're causing to the earth that, that, that humans are marking that are going to remain in the geologic record. Um, uh, and, and, and that's, that's why we're, we're, we're able to call it the Anthropocene. Um, and so, so that, and, and again, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. There, there are alternatives. There are, um, by, you know, biodegradable, plant-based, plastic substitutes. There are alternatives. You know, this is this is these are choices. These are policy choices, and and we can change the, the situation. It doesn't it, it doesn't have to be this way. So I think anytime you're feeling fatalistic, I think you gotta you gotta say okay. We you know. How do we how do we change this? How do we vote? How do we get this on the political agenda? How do we change it locally, statewide, nationally? Um, how do we and and Catherine Hayhoe, who's a very famous climate scientist, she says one of the best things we can do about climate change is talk about it um, and talk to our friends and family. We need to we need to be talking about these issues. We need to be talking about plastic. We need to be talking about our emissions, uh, you know, consumption. Um, the, the, that it's it's an essential step. I think a lot of people feel feel fatalistic, and and I, and 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 it's not you know it's not game over. We're we're not done. There is still time to to correct a lot of the these these impacts that that can seem overwhelming. But but that they've come about through choices. Maybe not choices that you and I made intentionally, but choices that certain people made in certain boardrooms and in certain leg legislative chambers were made. But those changes can be reversed, and those decisions can be reversed. So um, I think you gotta you gotta remain. If you believe in human agency, you have to remain hopeful. Um, <laughs> you have to. We don't have a choice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Huggy beer, going back to the virtual reality. I'm not generally prone to motion sickness, but the one time I tried VR, no bueno for my head. Is that a me problem, or uh, if the technology was better, frame rate resolution, would that not be a problem? I it, Early film, you know, the Lumiere brothers, when they showed a train arriving at the station, people ran out of the theater. Um, <laughs> so I think... There is a learning curve that comes with it, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a, and it's a body. Learn we didn't always sit in dark rooms and watch movies for two hours, right? That was, people had to learn to do that, and so I think there's, I've found similar things. Most VR experiences, right now, uh, the the um, kind of the more documentary type of work that I look at are short. They're 10, 15, 20 minutes at the most. They're they're not 40 minute. Uh, experiences so um, so I think it's not uncommon to feel some motion sickness I think the, the trick is is to um, you know buy, notice when you're feeling bad take a break uh, and look for other um, you know other other experiences that aren't that don't have so much movement there's a lot of work out there it's really diverse you know the, the the range of possible experiences is really diverse. So so I think um, do spend some time exploring um, the the technology because I I do think it is very powerful and I do think it's going to be around and it's going to change um, it's going to change the way we work and the way we interact and it's gonna it's gonna have a big impact um, on on the near future. Um, so, so I think it's a, you know, it's a technology to, that's worth getting a handle on. I mean, but there are some biological, I, a lot of that motion sickness, if I'm not mistaken, is like when you turn your head, there's an expectation of a certain visual response. And if the latency of the VR is certain time behind that, that's where that, that motion sickness comes from, right? There is some degree of that. There is some of that. And then yeah. there's also the, um, if you've ever been on a ship, 
Yeah. And and when you're Point inside the ship and you're not <laughs> able to see the horizon move, yeah. um, but the room is moving, your brain, that's what seasickness is. Actually, your brain, your brain thinks that you're sick. So it's trying to, so it raises your temperature because it thinks you're biologically sick. Mm -hmm. So seasickness is, is your brain um, trying to, uh, assuming that you're, you're sensing motion when you shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and so it's it's similar with with VR where if 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 your body is not um, getting the same signals that your eyes are, then then your body often reacts with um, with with sickness, motion sickness. Um, yeah. So presumably there's a balance of like experience and what to receive, and but also technology. If your frame rate's higher, if your computational power is higher, it should mitigate some of that so, some of that yeah. yeah and it's also the 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 production of the 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 media um because some some games um are better than others and and uh and the way you move around in a game some games allow for kind of smooth smooth motion and others uh, like uh, have a something they call teleporting where you could you put a, like a little marker goes uh, ahead of you and then you you just leap to that marker automatically and that tends to reduce motion sickness so using using teleporting as opposed to smooth movement because uh, the smooth movement can be unsettling uh, catching up on a few comments uh good man jam i i went to virtual burning man with dr opal amazing host genius <laughs> awesome thank you for joining us good man thank you for being on the stream if you're not following click the follow button it helps for our visibility as well as other things plus you get standard internet units a big spooky skeleton i promised myself i'll buy uh whatever vr headset valve releases next money be damned <laughs> the main complaint i've heard for vr is lack of content I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, maybe, I mean, for, for serious gamers that are wanting a particular kind of first person shooter thing or something, I think I've, I've heard that, but, uh, I, I've found, you know, an incredible variety and wealth of, of content and experiences. Um, but if you, you know, if you don't like social VR, you don't want to explore that world. That's the thing. These, whether it's VR chat or alt space, or or even um meta's horizons um you know there's there's a lot going on there um so uh everything from performances to classes um you know to, to meetups uh you know it's 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 diverse so uh i think i, I think it's more about taking the time to explore uh and and and, and be willing to try some of the the more the, you know, maybe things that aren't that aren't so easily identified as like, okay, that, I know what this is as a first-person shooter. This is a an, an RPG. Um, yeah. All right, let's see what are we got. All right, we ladies and do gentlemen. One more thing, other than uh, we are at ten thirty. It is time for the the ultimate gaming experience. We're gonna play Narc for the NES. Okay. <laughs> this is the one every single one of our guests plays. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to do it with infinite lives, infinite mi missiles, infinite bullets, and you are about to win the war on drugs. So okay. this game was written and designed by Nancy Reagan. <laughs> Enjoy your journey. <laughs> Literally says, just say no. <laughs> so go ahead and press start. Okay. Your goal in this is going to be walk right and just find doors. Okay. So you get no advantage for killing people. So there's two buttons, but they give you four commands. If you tap B, you jump. If you hold B, you squat. If you tap A, you do rockets. If you hold A, you do bullets. So just play around with it. But yeah, walk but right. Do I kill these monks? You can if you want. It doesn't. It doesn't give you anything. <laughs> So yes, this was an early arcade were, game. Were, they, were these drug dealers, or, yes. or they yeah. are? They're, yeah, or, and or flashers. They're, they're Buddhist drug dealers, though. <laughs> they, 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 they look like they've just come out of the monastery. <laughs> but, oh man, I didn't time you. Oh, okay, we're gonna start over. Uh, okay. <laughs> we got a timer. I speed run video games, so I take my timing of gaming very seriously. Right, well, but you gotta you, you get, tell. It's like we were saying, the game structures. Uh, your goal so what's what, what are my goal my goal is to just get to the end do i blow past walk right find a door <laughs> well, walk walk right find, find the door. door yep that's okay. it all right press start i'll okay. start the timer when okay. it goes this started as a joke now every single guest plays so you okay. will be on a leaderboard with every faculty member that has been a guest okay. <laughs> so heads up no pressure all right and i know oh, I've, yeah, i can crouch yep i can crouch and shoot but I, but I can't jump 
You can jump. If you tap B, you jump. So they turn four oh, buttons into, yeah, okay. just there based on how long you Oh, hold. I see. If I hold it, it, it crouches. There we go. <laughs> but he doesn't die. No, no, you have infinite life. Oh, that's Ooh. my door. Yep. Sorry. It's going to be oh, go right. right you're going to find key cards. You're going to find doors, and you're going to walk through them. And this is the game of NARC. <laughs> <laughs> Also a documentary filmed in real time. <laughs> oh, he does die. All right. All right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you have infinite of those lives. So, yeah, walk right, find key cards, find doors. I don't get rid of those guys. I don't want to be shot. Like <laughs> <laughs> so this started out as a joke. This is a bargain bin game from my childhood. Oh, so you want to pick up that thing? Yep. Oh. And then... I, I played it on stream, and then I made every guest play it on stream. So you are in a long line of... You're probably the 30th guest to play this game. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm honored. But a fun way to close the night. And, yeah, and, and, you know, anything from the Reagan era that... Uh... <laughs> It's just, it's the a, war on drugs. Well, we're still living in it, you know. We're 40 years in now on the whole neoliberal project, and uh, our, our, our the Gini coefficient. Uh, you know, I don't know if you the Gini coefficient is the gap between the wealth, uh, the rich and poor, and mm -hmm. so um, uh, a Gini coefficient of zero would be everybody had the exact same amount of money, and mm -hmm. a Gini coefficient of one would be one person had all the money. Mm -hmm. And since Ronald Reagan initiated the neoliberal the accelerated neoliberal project starting in 1980 so in the in the 42 years since the neoliberal project has been accelerated um our Gini coefficient as a country has gone from uh 0.3 to 0.6 so uh we have widened our gap in um between the rich and the poor. So I haven't I haven't heard that coefficient, but there's there's a metric like CEO versus average employee pay went from four hundred to one or forty to one to like four thousand to one yep, or something yep, like yep, that. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well and we're at a point now where the um the top three wealthiest people on the planet own as much as the bottom forty eight countries. Um so uh that that concentration well that's interesting because that Gini coefficient and, th and again, this is all, don't go that way. Don't, oh, I saw it. Yeah. Um, uh, that um, is coming out of Ministry of the Future again. Um, they were, uh, he was talking about how Bangladesh and, uh, and Denmark have the same Gini coefficient of 0.3, but the average income in Denmark is $50,000 a year, oh. and the average income in Bangladesh. That's interesting. It's five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Um, that's a limited scope. So, so right. Uh, that's interesting. Oh, there's the exit. Um, yeah. So, so right. So, so you don't. So you, so, you need to be careful. About sorry to intervene. You have to shoot those guys with bullets and not rockets. Oh. Oh. So hold A. Instead of tapping, just hold it down. Oh, I'll just hold. Yeah. Oh, but hold A, and they'll drop a blue card. So, yep. So you're gonna have to walk up and shoot one of those guys, and they're gonna drop a blue card at some point, and somewhere near the door. Yeah, nope, oh, there it is. Nope. You'll, nice. nope, you'll see it. It'll, it'll be obviously blue. But this is uh, dictated by RNG, which is random number generator. So it's kind of just like whenever it happens. If you want to shoot the dog, press both buttons simultaneously. That's intriguing. All right, I'll give you another question while you're trying to farm a card from random drops on NARC. Um, so I have this every time I go on an airplane and I sit next to somebody that wants to converse, they're like, what do you do? Uh, and I'm uh, like, uh, I'm a chemist. And they say, oh, I hated chemistry. <laughs> what, what, what is your airplane conversation like? So you got the card, oh, now you can I, go I, through it. Okay, yeah. Oh, what's my airplane conversation yeah, like? So uh, go to the card oh, thing. Oh, oh, oh. You got to insert it. <laughs> then you go. You know, realistic. <laughs> What's your airplane plane conversation like? Uh, well, it depends if they're um, if they're wearing a, a red MAGA hat or not. Um, <laughs> no, that's a good point. Or, or whether I, if I'm wearing a mask and they're and they're upset about the fact that I'm wearing a mask. No, no, you know, plane travel has gotten uh, has gotten challenging these days, especially when you're six five oh. and, and riding coach. Uh, <laughs> I feel for you. Uh, but um, 
Yeah, don't. Let's go right. <laughs> yeah, no, nope. don't, don't waste your time. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you wanting to clean up the streets, <laughs> but this is an endless supply of scumbags. <laughs> you will never win this war. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I like to talk to people, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I like to and I like to hear stories. And I like to hear um, hear their. Uh, you know what, what they're up to. So no, I like, and I like to talk to different, and, and and I and I like to talk to people. You know, different. I like to talk to conservatives who are willing to talk. Um, I just I don't like to talk to like people. When people get angry at me because I'm wearing a mask, that's when I, yeah. I get upset. So go to the car. Yeah, you can actually fine. jump in it if you tap B. I mean, so when they ask you what do you do, I oh. mean, is your answer professor? Is it filmmaker? Is it like how how do you how do you oh approach right that? right right and and. Uh, yeah, that, it's, that it's spawns a lot, the, right? That's yeah. Is it both buttons you said? No, just no. tap B. Oh, just oh short, oh, like, like, yep. Okay. All right, oh, now you're in the car. Look at that. Oh. No, but now. Okay. <laughs> That's our favorite That's part. It. <laughs> but so can you, if so you, you, come to the you can memorize a pattern, and, yeah, yeah, but you don't have a choice. You don't know this game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. God, so much. <laughs> You'll get another one. Don't okay. worry. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> He's got, he's kind of got a Michael Jackson thing going on, doesn't he? He's... But yeah, I'm sitting next to you on an airplane. I'm like, what do you do? What, what's your, what's yeah, your Yeah, I would probably say, uh, I'm, I'm a professor. Yeah. And, and, then, and then let it ask, go from there. Well, what are you a professor of? Um, exactly. And then, and then try and, you know, keep it, keep it generic and until, and see where the probing goes. I see. But it's the same with, you know, I, I so I've had practice in this because, because. Tap uh, jump and you can get over this. Uh, the other button. There you go. Because um, you know, I, I graduated from Harvard as an undergrad, mm -hmm. so I often it's often like, well, where'd you go to school? I went to school in the Northeast. Uh, you know, because it's like I don't I don't like to you know people then make, you bias it, yeah. Yeah, they make certain assumptions, and then and it, and it, and then and then it gets into some annoying conversation of like, oh, so so I I would just assume like if they really want to know, then I'll uh, we'll talk about it. But mm -hmm. but um but I, I I'm always hesitant to just have that be like the first thing they think about me you know like so it's kind of the same with with being a faculty member and mm -hmm. you know wanting to downplay but then when when they do get around to it i often say it's the best best job it's the last best job is what i say because it's still it's it's been um you know tenure and 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 the time being paid to think which is Mm -hmm. How I think a lot of my job, what I think a lot of my job is. Um, well, now you can add getting paid to play video games to your resume. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is outreach. This counts. It's research. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. No, we're we're forming collaborations. We're building bridges, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. <laughs> this right. isn't just oh, us good. drinking alcohol and playing video games. <laughs> That's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back in the car, ladies and gentlemen. All right, we're going to do another predictions. This one is science related. It's a historical science related one. Um, start prediction. If you're not following us, click the follow button. We're going to give you some standard internet units. We're going to be asking a question about national parks. Note you are on Ask a Scientist Gaming Honor Code. You could look up this answer. It's pretty straightforward, but try to answer it without looking up that answer because these are imaginary internet units and they don't matter. But let's answer this question. What? Air creating prediction? Does it not like the period? Uh, what the heck? I don't know why it's not letting me do that. That's interesting. So sometimes Twitch has filters for keywords and we don't know what they are. Like microfluidics is one of those. GPA is another one. We don't know what that is either. And I don't know what about this question is not making it happy. The question or is it the answer? Oh. As you traverse, I mean, you made it farther than most. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you took the the, the, oh, the researched that. approach. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why it's not letting me do this. This is intriguing. Well, I'll give you a question so we can fill some time while I troubleshoot this. Um, if you had like two years to start over in a different discipline, like learn a different expertise, become uh, a yeah. chemist, a physicist, a sociologist, a whatever, yeah. where would you go? Yeah. What would you do? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, 
Uh, I think I think I might be a journalist. Um, uh, you know, because I think one of the frustrations of, of academic writing is the small audience, and and I do like I like to feel like um, people are. Uh, uh, you know, actually reading what I've bothered to written, right? You know, yeah, um, and 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 bothered to to put to have uh, if I have something to say. All right, and I, and I and I guess I also want to. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Huggy yeah. beer. Apparently that showed up. It was saying it was an error on my screen. I apologize for you guys. I'm opening it up again. Uh, the question is: the first national park in the United States was it Yellowstone or was it Yosemite? You guys have two minutes to answer this question. If you're not following, click the follow button. Use your standard internet units. Gamble them. You can make us drink alcohol. You can make request a factoid. Um, I apologize for cutting you off if you guys answered already. But answer again. It's open. Um, but yeah, sorry, Andy. You want, okay. you want people to read what you're writing? Yeah, yeah. And and so um, I, I think. Being a, a journalist and or investigative journalist would probably be my um, yeah. uh, my my alternate um, career uh, path. Um, at least one of them, you know, because because I've also written some children's books, and um, and 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 I've really enjoyed that process. I've got a series of children's books. Um, I mean, uh, what's nice about that is you can at least track clicks and views and book purchases and. So you want to grab that card. Oh, go back in that door. Grab that white card. I mean, that is one of the, I mean, I guess uh, peer-reviewed literature now tracks views and things like that. So you get yeah. thumb metrics at least. Yeah. Is there, uh, yeah. Uh, no, the hitbox is but, terrible. The, the tracking, like... And do I know when I picked it up? Or is yeah, it? no, it should it should fly off screen. It's just, it's a, it's a weird... So go right and just go over it. <laughs> yeah. Do I have to press it, it no, I think you just have to go over it, and okay. it's it's just a weird yeah. what it looks like and where it is is not the same thing. We need a virtual reality version of NARC. <laughs> right. right. There, we oh, there we go. Okay, press up, but not too up. There we go. There we go. Now left to the silver card door, and you're through. Okay. So, so journalism that would be. I mean, it's it's a very interesting time to get in the field of journalism, right? Because well, traditional because journalism the whole industry's collapsed. Yeah, yeah, like what yeah. what does that look yeah. like now? Well, and then and and then in some ways, like everyone is a writer now, you know, with Substack and um, you know try, trying to do like independent journalism where people pay. But then again, like somebody like Heather Cox Richardson, I don't know if you know her. She's a historian who has uh, you know a couple thousand followers who all who all pay her you know ten bucks a month. Way. And, um, yeah. and and she's making she's making way more money writing her her daily you know she writes five times a week maybe 500 to 750 words a day and um uh you know it's making way more money doing that than um so you have to oh, I gotta go find the green card. you have to shoot these rambo looking guys with bullets oh, okay. not rockets but bullets right. So hold. Yep. Yep. Oh, but not not the. Oh. Yep. We For some them. reason, it only drops the Rambo guys when you hit them with bullets. I don't know the rules. Actually, I do know the rules of this game because we've deconstructed it. We've played a lot of Narc. <laughs> but now that's intriguing. I mean, but that that oh, there it is. The, that scenario you're describing is the exception and not the like standard. For every one of those success stories, there's thousands. Oh, and there's a lot failures. of people who are putting their their work out there and and just and not you know, and it's quality work and yeah, nobody's yeah, speaking. And they're really smart and have really yeah. interesting things to say. But but um, yeah. So so uh, so maybe that wouldn't be my. Uh, then uh, otherwise, I don't know. I might get into like boat. Um, Boat building. Um, I, I really love boats, and, and I grew up on a lake, and always, oh, fun. Uh, you know, I've always had boats and uh, sailboats and motorboats, and um, yeah. Florida's a good place to land for that. <laughs> yeah, although we're far, we're far from the water, really, to make it. You know, like I, in, where I grew up in New England, you know, we were, we had we had better access, so. Uh, yeah, go right. Stop. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not gaining anything. You're losing time. Losing time. <laughs> you are in a pride fest versus your colleagues. <laughs> like, oh, that's right. <laughs> the, there's a timer. But, right? but it's very hard to tap my competition gene because I don't really have one. Oh, but. no worries. <laughs> none, none of this matters. This is entirely made up. The, end, the boss yeah, at the yeah. end will dictate everything. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's absolutely terrible. <laughs> All right. So the guess was first national park. 
Andy, what is the answer? The answer is Yellowstone. 98% got that correct. We had a dark horse vote. Huggy Beer went against it. That would have been a 51 to pay out had it been Yosemite, but the answer is Yellowstone. Yeah. And I'll do the quote here. It's March 1st, 1872. President Ulysses S. Grant signed the Yellowstone National Park Protection Act into law. The first national park was born. So after that, it was Sequoia in 1890, Yosemite in 1890, um, and Mount Rainier in 1899. So again, a decision to protect the environment. Yeah, and Come John Muir, uh, for, you know, creator of the Sierra Club, played a key role in all that. Um, you know, was a was a, was a major voice. And all right, Good Man Jam is doing a plug for you. Tell them about the documentary in the lunch counter with Tamir Rice's mom. Oh, the uh, traveling while black. Um, that's one of yours. Yeah, uh, no, but that is a that is a, a VR documentary oh, that is that is incredible. Um, so traveling while black, and it was shot in the the diner. So the the man who created the Green Book, and the Green Book was a a, a guide for African Americans traveling in the fifties, like post World War Two fifties and sixties, finding safe um, restaurants and hotels that they could that would be safe for African Americans to stay and eat in. And, um, and so he, he owned a diner in Washington, D.C., and so the film is shot in that diner um, and goes through uh, some of this history. Um, and, um, and, and so you have the card. Sorry. Oh, I, I do it. have the yeah, card. Yeah, yeah. You, you have the blue and the red. You'll go through those. Okay. Yep. Um, and, then, and then, so in the final scene, then you are sitting in a booth, in the booth, in the diner with Tamir Rice's mother. Wow. Who is then telling the story. And it's funny because earlier in the in the piece, all the people in the diner at the counter are all doing their thing. But then finally in that last scene, everyone at the counter turns and is listening to Tamir Rice's mother tell the story. And this is VR 3D. You can look at the room. Yeah, while you can look all that. around. And then they did really interesting visual effects because there's a mirror right next to you because you're sitting in the booth. Um, I mean, that's intriguing because you get a social experience in a movie. Yeah, Like in a exactly. submersion. And that's, that's, wow. Exactly. No, it's really... Um, that's a different storytelling mechanism than you're used to that's right. that's breathtaking right and that's and that's part of what captured my, yeah, my yeah. attention that's that's interesting. Uh, and, and felt like okay there there's something going on with this technology and there's some real power in it uh -huh. um and and we need to explore these tools and get it in the hands of students and, and uh, other creative people and and see see what we can do and um I'm saying this on record for YouTube. You should kill the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Hold both buttons and you'll squat and bullets. Yep. <laughs> we kill a whole lot of dogs every stream. I apologize to the audience who's sensitive to that subject matter. <laughs> well, uh, he's kind of like RoboCop, isn't he? Oh, yeah, no. Like Robo but it's funny because RoboCop, right. the RoboCop would not be a fan of Nancy Reagan. But, but, <laughs> True. Uh, but RoboCop, that, that, that's it. All right. Now you got to shoot the guy in the wheelchair with a rocket. Oh, okay, yeah. So the other sense. Sentence I wrote utter every right. stream. Terry Galloway would like this, like like shooting the guy in the wheelchair. She, <laughs> she, she's she's a good one for crip humor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when he comes out, tap a rocket the wheelchair guy. You have to do that three times. This is this is where the game gets pretty terrible. Oh, oh just tap a. Yep. Yep. It's a little faster. There you go. Uh oh. Yeah, so you have about seven frames to do a tap A to get a rocket. All right, what else? What do I have left on my list? I guess this is a fun one. What is your, like, in, in, in your professional career as an academic, as a professor, what is your, like, I made it moment or your, like, I, I finally did it or pinnacle of achievement? Uh -huh. uh, what, what is your most impactful moment? Uh -huh. Interpret that as you will. Um, oh, that's a good question. I'm not tapping, am I? Uh, yep, there you go. Yeah, I think it's one of those, like, just get it on there. How many factoids are left? I mean, as many as you want to request. <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Andy is a wealth of knowledge. He has an infinite... 
pool of factoids. <laughs> How'd you feel? <laughs> a request away. While he debates what his most impactful well, moment was. Yeah, yeah. He made it uh, moment. Uh, well, I, I guess I, I would say I don't feel like I have made it, but uh, <laughs> I'm still uh, waiting I'm for still it. Still waiting for it. Right, right. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess probably. Uh, yeah, you're, you're just pressing it a little too long. Yep. So maybe press it less hard. Yeah. Like yeah. the harder you press, it has a yeah. detection range. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna. Okay, that was it, right? Where it's got the red. Yep, that's yep, it. That's okay. the thing. Right. Yep, you want to hit him with that that's thing. What I want. Okay. Yep. These other guys, I'm gonna. We learned a lot about history tonight. Yeah, and I'm always a little suspicious of uh, of of kind of the, the making it thing too. You know, I, I, um. Uh, you know, it's a, it's that old uh, either pride goeth before the fall, or, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, and or um, careful what you wish for. You, yeah. You know? So I think I, it's more like looking back on things and realizing, oh wow, that was pretty cool, or, or yeah, that, I... that worked out really well, or and and various projects and collaborations. I, the most fun I have is is working with working with people and having good collaborations. You know, the Apalachicola River fun project was super fun because of Georgia Ackerman, who's the Apalachicola River Keeper, and Bill Landing. And then uh, did another project on Florida Climate Change Project with Chari Arespa Chichaga and, and um, Stephanie Powell. Um, oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Stephanie Powell, you know, that, and that's one of the things I miss about um, you know, like I don't like I, I I've been trying to figure out ways to get two faculty in the same classroom at the same time, like um, so that we can you know riff on like we're doing now, you know, like we're to, mm -hmm. like exchange points of view and questions and different expertise on on a. And, and and get the and 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 have different students too working together. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> smart told you this gets terrible. I apologize. Oh, you got him. <laughs> he inchwormed. So two more times getting the wheelchair guy. Oh, two oh, more times. So hold both buttons. Kill the hold dogs. On, I'm trying to get these. Yep. There the you dogs go. Now. There they go. Yep. So now you'll just oh, kill a back. bunch of things, and then eventually wheelchair guy will come back. <laughs> Uh, Huggy Beer missed it. Um, Huggy Beer, we have an infinite amount of factoids. So if you want to request any, Andy is happy, happy to deliver knowledge bombs on you. We have many of those. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to request those. Um, oh yeah, we did the plastics one. Yeah. That's fun. We did that one I think we could still do. Uh... Oh, Huggy Beer redeemed request a factoid with 300 internet units. Andy dropped the knowledge bomb on him after killing him twice. Oh no, two, two factoids. <laughs> Rich, spending your stint. All oh, three factoids. <laughs> All right, Andy, you have three factoids to deliver. Factoid one. All right, factoid one. Buying less stuff is the single most important thing you can do to address the climate crisis. It's not buying an electric car. It's not eating vegan. It's uh, it's just buy less stuff. Reduce, reuse, recycle, repair. According to the UN, protecting the climate by buying fewer things. Shop secondhand, repair what you can, and recycle. Every kilogram of textiles produced generates 17 kilograms of CO2. So buying fewer new clothes and other consumer goods can reduce your carbon footprint uh, most effectively. So, you know, it's, 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 it, it is a ultimate violation of the consumer society, but it is the ultimate affirmation of support for a sustainable future. In so. particular, cell phones, don't buy a new one every year. There is so much things that go into a cell phone. Like the uh, textiles are one thing, but technology, rare earth elements, oh my God. When you do the math, it's terrible. All right. Now we're on to Mr. Big. Yeah, now we're on to Mr. Big. <laughs> he, he just swallows me. <laughs> it's, you know, the giant robotic head. He's, he's the in charge of the war on drugs. <laughs> so what you're going to want to do is run away from him and go to the top of the screen. 
And if you're at the top of the screen, his tongues don't hit you. So go up even further. Even further okay. Yep. So go to the very top. And you're going to turn around and you're going to jump and shoot. And so the jump shoot is tapping B and then tapping A. So if you stop walking, turn around, stand still, tap B, we'll jump. And then when you're in the air, tap A. A little less time on A. Yeah, very close. So we'll press it lighter, probably. And so you're gonna walk away from him the other way. And you're gonna basically have to shoot him in the hat to get his hat off. Oh. All right, well, one factoid down. <laughs> Andy, factoid another down. one while fighting Mr. Big, no pressure. Uh, right, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, um, go with the, yeah, let's see, okay, right. We're, so we're talking about VR and impact. Of, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna... Yep. Very similar. Less yeah. time on A yeah, will get yeah, you that yeah. rocket. Yeah. All right. So the number one best-selling Oculus game, um, if you can believe it, we, we were going to do this as a yes or no, but it's um, it is Beat Saber. Beat Saber. So that's uh, a fun game. Yeah, you know, it's, it's rock and, band, and, full body, and it right. It, it's a cardio workout. Um, Do you have Beat Saber? I don't. <laughs> you're, not, you're not contributing. No, to I'm that. not contributing. No, and uh, I, I would prefer my set, my VR sedentary. Thank you very much. <laughs> If you guys aren't familiar, Beat Saber is you get to use lightsabers and you're playing Rock Band where objects come at you and you get to hit them to the beat, which is, so that's the best selling game at 80 million in revenue. Yeah, that, that's a lot of money for Yeah, for a VR game. That's incredible. If you get, oh, there it is. Okay, now you don't have to jump anymore. Uh, now you just walk away, but you turn around and shoot him in the face with okay. a rocket. All right. Get some distance. Yeah, get the further away yeah. you are, the easier. All right, that's factoid two. We still have one more factoid. We still have one more factoid. Um, let's see. Um, no, oh, intriguing. right, right, right. This is a good one. Um, so, you know, everybody talks about... Oh, look at this skull. Everybody talks about Andrew Yang. Gives Andrew Yang a lot of credit for advocating for the UBI, Universal Basic Income. All right, I'm going to intervene before you do this. So yeah. you're going to want to go down to somewhere in this, like, portion of the screen. You're going to do the bullets. So just hold A, like, walk away, turn around, hold A, walk away more, turn around, hold A, repeat. Anyway, sorry. Andrew Yang, Universal Basic Income. So Andrew basic. Yang, Universal Basic Income. You know, everyone's like... Oh, you know, oh, he, he's such a visionary. So progressive. So progressive. But actually, you know who um, at, who came very close to passing a universal basic income in the U.S. And, and wanted to sign the bill? Once again, our old friend Richard Nixon. <laughs> yes, in 1969, Republican Richard Nixon tried to pass the Family Assistance Plan FAP proposing to replace the country's largest welfare program at the time, um, the aid to families and the with dependent children, children uh, with a guaranteed minimum income for all families with children, and it was going to be it was about it was fifteen hundred dollars, which was the equivalent of um, ten thousand dollars today uh, a year, and the Democrats didn't think it was enough, so they um, they fought it, oh. uh, and um, but that. Uh, that that and that that Nixon was an advocate for universal basic income, and and there so there's been a, a slew of sociological studies, um, and economic studies done all around the world over the last, you know, better part almost a hundred years. Um, so whole day, and, bullets, bullets, whole day, yep. And Just hold um, it, hold and it down. and it's hold been it shown, hold it down. Yep, there you go. Yep, and you just walk away, do it again. Sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, it's been shown that if you that just giving mo people money is actually the best thing you can do. You don't need to tell them you can only buy, you know, don't buy beer or don't buy, you know, don't buy junk food. You know, all these like anxieties about like oh, people need to be um, encouraged to do the right thing. Actually, when you give people 
the money when they don't have any, they actually use it really wisely and and better their lives. So um, it's a uh, UBI is an old idea that has been shown to be incredibly effective in numerous uh, studies over the last hundred years, and um, and and we and we had a chance at it in 1969 under Republican President Richard Nixon, but instead. Um, we didn't, it didn't happen. And now, now, you know, the whole idea is just, is talked about as if it's some, um, socialist pipe dream, um, you know, that only AOC would support. Yeah. And, and so again, we've forgotten our history. We've forgotten, we've forgotten the science of, of, um, of, of help of, of, you know, how do you, how do you serve people in need and how, how do you help people out of, cause really the problem with being poor is a lack of money. It's not a lack of intelligence. It's not a lack of morals. It's, it's, it's work it's, ethic or drive or work or, ethic or yeah. drive. It's a lack of money. Yeah. And, so, and, 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 and yet the, you know, the, the grafting on of, of morality onto poverty is, 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 is just such a widespread assumption that, that drives so much of our politics and it's so misguided. And so, it's, a, it's a recent development. Uh, like well, it's, it's so right, really been accelerated yeah, yeah, recently. Yeah. So, yeah. so if we could really just get, uh, you, you know, again, bring science back into the equation and evidence-based um, policy making, we would realize the best use of our tax dollars and, and, and resources as a society is to give people who don't have enough money to how then clothe and feed themselves the money to how and clothe and feed themselves you know all right i'm going to give you a tip on this so, okay. so walk away from him turn back and shoot him yep. but press up a little bit while you're shooting him okay. and it, it's the hit boxes are terrible i apologize for this boss there you go all right there, you go. sorry I, there we go. now it's a dog food right. tray it looks like dog food <laughs> and you have your gold card okay I, oh, oh good my gold card i got I, maybe i can get it. up bumped up to D delta comfort plus <laughs> <laughs> okay here we go if anyone has suggestions on who we should raid put them in chat right now we are wrapping up really soon yeah off to see who's in science. well thank you ken for this uh <laughs> this game <laughs> this interesting this is, experience this civil forfeiture the level uh, there, there's the door all right 32 minutes and 13 seconds congratulations you won the war on drugs yeah exactly you made the board you're not at the bottom you're not at the top you're somewhere in the middle that's fine all right if anyone has suggestions on who we should raid you should put those in chat right now you should put your initials okay. they won't keep beyond me shutting this program but it feels good to put initials in oh yeah it's probably old been school. a while old school Oh, you went with legit initials, not USA, not ass. <laughs> Classic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us at Ask a Scientist Gaming, mediocre gameplay expert science. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, not necessarily science tonight, although science-related things. Uh, our first guest from the communications de department, Dr. Andy Opal, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining me. It's It's got to be weird receiving an email saying, do you want to play video games and talk on stream? But you said yes, and I really appreciate that. Um, do you have any parting words for the audience well i really appreciate you having me ken and and i and i think science you know we need to expand the definition of it and you have tonight by inviting me in and i i think this is the dialogue and the and the the collaborations that need to happen is between the arts and the sciences absolutely um and and tonight was a great was a great example of that so so thank you very much for having me no it's been an awesome dialogue and i really appreciate it again i have fun i learn everything every time we do these streams so i really appreciate it um um, anyone joining the stream again follow us get notifications about future streams where every other wednesday night typically uh next in two weeks we'll actually have it on thursday night we have a special guest uh josh dr josh melko from um university of north florida who's actually a professor in the chemistry department there but also had a year of leave of absence to be a congressional advisor so he's in washington dc actually working with politicians talking to them about science and things like that so builds really nicely on a lot of things we talked about this week um but that'll be thursday Thursday, I think that's December 1st, I want to say. Yes, December 1st. Thursday, December 1st, 8 to 11 p.m. Josh Melka will be on. Join us again. You can ask him all the questions about all the dirt he's learned 
in his time at Washington, D.C. Um, but yeah, until then, it's a pleasure. Your guys' questions and communications and comments really make this an awesome experience. We really love our time here. Um, so we'll figure out somebody to raid, probably somebody in the sciences. But until we see you guys again, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Uh, until next time.